Can everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the United States of America, United States of America and, to the and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible liberty with liberty and justice, and justice for all. For all. don't see is Tom. I don't see. Oh, there he is. Okay. And Nancy, you're there. Okay. Very good. All right. Hello. Hello. All right. Welcome everybody to uh, the board of selectmen uh, special meeting. Um, before we begin, um, I just, I want to take a moment to thank um, everyone on the charter revision commission who's put in so much time um, and effort uh, to uh, re-examining our charter and uh, paying so much close attention to everything and to all the emails and the public comment, um, but most especially to uh, listening to all the presentations that you listened to, which I think were really uh, invaluable for your work that you did um, and listening about other uh, forms of government that are out there. And I want to also thank uh, Attorney Mednick. Um, I, I <laughs> appreciate, I'm very glad that we um, hired you to help the Charter Revision Commission. I don't think um, they would have, uh, uh, they, I think they would still be meeting <laughs> without your help. So um, kudos to you and uh, all your hard work. Uh, obviously your experience has been very invaluable to the commission and um, I, I personally do appreciate it. And I wanna, um, Thank Attorney Baldwin too for his efforts. I know he's he's very busy with town business, and he, he did put a lot of time and effort into making sure um, that he was here, you know, available to answer questions and be uh, helpful to the commission. I mean, I don't think people realize that the commission has been meeting for nine months, um, which is a lot of time uh, for a volunteer commission, and it's been a tremendous amount of time. And I don't think that they uh, they were always treated with a, um, a complete. Uh, <laughs> positivity and respect, but I personally uh, respect all the hard work that you put in. And, um, and I, and I think our town will be better served for your efforts. Um, I want to announce um, that this, the presentation that's going to be shared is on the CRC webpage. It's um, on the first item on the page under CRC news for those who want to look at it after the fact, um, um, or maybe calling in and not be able to see it, uh, put up. Um, it's also under files and documents. So I am going to um, uh, hand this over to the chairman, the illustrious chairman, Mr. Caffarelli, who I am in, uh, very grateful to put taking on this effort. He is a very busy person and he put a lot of time and effort into this uh, for our community and chairing anybody um, is never a fun activity um, and being in charge of uh, dealing with the commission and all the public and all of that and, and uh, sharing information is a lot is a lot of work. And so thank you very much um, on behalf of the, the town of Board of Selectmen and also the town of Fairfield. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Mr. Caffarelli to uh, present to the Board of Selectmen. Well, thank you very much, uh, You're Madam on mute, Brian. Oh. Sorry. Uh, no, I'm not. I I can hear him. Tom, can you not hear no, me? Still I can hear you. I, I can, can hear you, Brian. Brian. You should be good at this by now. Well, everyone else He's can He's not hear on mute. He's not on mute. Maybe Brenda can hear. Is someone with Brenda that they Maybe, can tell um, him? Dave Kelly, can you, I don't know if Dave Kelly, Dave Kelly should be on. Dave, do you think there's something on our end here or, or is it on Brian's? It's on yours. You. Okay, here we go. Select woman, Lef Lefkowitz, can you hear me also? Yes. I can Sorry, hear Brian. you beautifully, Brian. Oh, okay. I, you, you know what, Brian? I had my mute button on my <laughs> It's only oh, Monday. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah. All right. Thank you once again. And appreciate the introductions. And uh, truly, it, it was uh, 
an honor to to serve and to participate in this process. Uh, I learned a lot and I um, got to know several people along the way and I'm very appreciative for that. Um, thank you uh, everyone on the board um, for select woman Kupchik, uh, select woman Lefkowitz and select woman, select woman Flynn uh, for, for the time today to allow us to present to you. And so uh, I did want to recognize that, you know, again, echoing what uh, the first select woman said, um, Attorney Mednick, you've been an invaluable help. We would not be here today if it was not for you. Um, also, big thanks to the the other um, the people who pulled a lot of weight in the town, um, Prue and uh, Jen. Thank you both, and to my fellow commissioners, um, you know, who are all here, um, save for one who has had some scheduling conflicts. Thank you. Uh, we wanted to provide this afternoon a uh, briefing on the updates to the charter. You do have a PowerPoint, which I'd ask uh, be shared. I think that Prue is going to do that, or I can, if that's not the case. Has that happened? Perfect. So we'll be on page one. Um, and so we are providing a briefing on the updates to the charter. It's a supplement to the material you've seen already. So we're on page two, Prue. Um, that uh, with the transmittal letter and the updated um, charter, which is our recommendations. And we um, know that you are familiar with our work. Um, we've provided uh, updates along the way to each of you individually. And I think that um, you've also been in contact with council. Um, we're gonna walk through this material, um, both myself and attorney Bendick in some more detail and then answer any questions that you may have. Um, and we are going to go on to uh, page two, the executive summary, please. So this page highlights our most significant changes from the proposed uh, updated charter. The rationale and information um, for each of these changes is provided in the following pages and supporting materials. Just uh, want to quickly go over them. They are the RTM, uh, these are the bullet points on page three, is uh, the proposed reduction to from 30 to 40 members. If, um, currently in the charter, actually it's 56 as a limit, but in, in today's number it is 40. Um, the budget process is streamlined in terms of the presentation to include shared budget meetings only for presentation and improved in efficiency and effectiveness. The Board of Education terms were altered to improve competitiveness, competitiveness in certain election cycles. The charter provides for a town administrator. Um, the rules of order and civility were added. There is no change to the governance structure for the town. No change to the governance structure for the town. And many individual changes have been made to improve accountability and streamline the charter for consistency readability and usefulness. Um, the next page, please. The objective here was to gather viewpoints on needed updates to the charter. Our, um, our charge was quite broad and we took a pretty um, comprehensive view of the charter. Uh, as you can see here, kind of the, the flow chart, essentially um, what we what we did, we received a lot of public input gathered throughout the process. Uh, we'll go into that a little further. Um, and out, outside expertise was leveraged to ensure an objective and structured process. And with um, that baseline understanding, uh, we, set a, we set about to propose some changes uh, and achieve understandable improvements. The next page, please. This page illustrates our overall approach. Um, it, uh, it's there are four vertical columns here providing information on each phase of work. As you will note, the first three columns are marked complete with the fourth one is uh, where we are today. And from reading left to right across the page, column one outlines our initial planning and analysis. The charge was developed, uh, the, the CRC was formed. We've gathered information. Um, we started meeting in September. Uh, we did not propose a uh, structure of what we were looking at until January. Um, we, revi we reviewed state regulations, other municipal information, outside expertise. Um, column two identified how we gathered input from the town officials and town residents. 
um, to column three highlights the analysis of the work that we did perform. And then column four is where we are now with the updated charter being considered by the body, uh, the board of selectmen. The next slide, please. So our deliverables are outlined on page six. Um, we, the, we, we had a kickoff presentation in October of 2021. Um, there are a number of primary deliverables on this page resulting from our work identified here. Um, in, it's, uh, in addition, our work has been documented by future use uh, by the town as needed in other documents, analysis, materials. So we, um, we, as you see on the, the slide here, there was an initial presentation in October all the way through our transmittal letter and revised charter that was submitted to you in June, which was a formal 14 page communication to you and uh, filed with the town clerk. It describes the details with work supporting that information and the charter changes and the actual revised charter. As you know, the ballot questions will be developed by yourselves um, with your council. The follow up recommendations, um, we do believe that in the future that um, a study of a town manager structure and in an overall uh, more of an over kind of a macro level follow up recommendation is if this board or any in the future would uh, seek to change the structure of governance, the groundwork would need to be laid well in advance of forming a charter revision. It's something that um, would require a lot more time than is allotted in a normal charter revision commission. And there's more on that later. Um, we did have, as is noted, um, all along the way, full open meeting documentation, all the agendas, the minutes, the documentate, the documents were posted on our website. We had a very detailed, um, comment grid that was tracked by council and updated along the way. I think we had close to um, 260 plus comments uh, from the public that was organized into a very readable fashion. Um, and then those uh, the meetings were also recorded and are online for all to see. Um, next slide, please. These next slides will um, go over the key changes uh, for each article, <laughs> and they are the new articles that have been submitted to you um, of the charter. And I know Attorney Mendick is going to go into detail on these um, for your edification and that of the public, but I'll highlight a few of them in Article 1. We did, um, in terms of organizing the charter, establish definitions, standard of meetings, um, we eliminated newspaper publications um, and in and existing standards of conduct were included with recommendations for RTM development of a new code of ethics. Um, Article two, the RTM size has been noted earlier, was changed to 30 members, but retaining the 10 districts that are currently in town. The Board of Election election cycle was modified for increased competition. Um, mean Board of Education. Board of Education. You said elections. That's all. Oh, okay. A lot of material here. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, the uh, Article 3, the various charter adjustments improve the ability of the RTM to adopt rules uh, of procedure and structure in an effort to become more accountable. Um, the next page, please. The article um, Board of Select Persons in Article 4, there were no major changes to the first select person or the Board of Select Persons role or significant responsibilities. Um, Attorney Mendek will go over uh, those individual changes. Article 5, um, consolidated the town clerk and elected boards of commissions with no changes other than some references and consolidations relating to vacancies. Um, article 6. We um, clarified several provisions which define expectations regarding qualifications and authority of various town officials um, and, and change the constables to be four that will be appointed by the board of select persons rather than being elected as is current practice. The next slide, please. Um, article, the next two articles, no significant changes. Um, Article 9, there is a budget procedure with the details uh, that will be forthcoming. And Article 10, 
Um, the town has now been given the authority to update the town seal and then the BOS, the Board of Select Persons, shall consider appointing the next uh, Charter Revision Commission no later than 10 years and every 10 years after that. Um, and as I said earlier, that we are recommending that the town engage in a thoughtful process to examine the benefits, benefits of modifying the structure of government prior to the next Charter Revision so that a future Revision Commission can focus on implementing changes around which um, there has been established some broad consensus. Um, the next slide, please. An article, the, um, the budget procedures, which is on the last slide that I'm going to cover on page 10. Um, it did clarify expectation, it seeks to clarify expectations regarding budget components and items to be included. It added several new provisions to underscore public accountability. Um, it does change the dates and the timing of the process um, somewhat. And um, following the budget submission, the first select person is required to deliver a budget address to the Board of Select Persons, Board of Finance, and RTM, including a question and answer period. Um, the, uh, the joint meetings shall not undermine the individual budget activities that can be taken on by the Board of Selectmen or Board of Finance or the RTM. Each group retains the opportunities to discuss the budget and make requests of submitting parties after the joint meetings. The objective of this proposal, the joint meetings, is to eliminate the redundancy and duplication wherever possible. Um, we, uh, we do recommend that the RTM create a robust committee system as we've seen uh, work uh, in other communities. And um, again, the Board of Finance does retain all other rights as contained in the existing charter and the charter maintains existing provisions of the Board of Select Persons and Board of Finance to agree on modifications to this budget process. Um, those are the highlights for me again. Um, it was a long process uh, to be sure. Uh, we did hear from a lot of members of the public, a lot of town officials, um, many experts, and um, it, you know a lot of consideration went into this. I think that you'll find that um, the changes are reasonable um, and do they do clean up the charter uh, greatly. And the proposals that are made um, are supported by uh, somebody going there. Supported by. Supported by can we mute that? Let me just quit it. Supported by um, documentation and um, materials that have been provided along the way and in uh, discussed among the members. So I'll turn it over to attorney Mendick at this point, and then we'll get to questions and answers. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, crew, if you don't mind, can you uh, switch to my presentation and start at um, number 12? But while she's doing that, let me just, um, start with a few preliminaries. I want to thank um, the first select person. Um, it's been an honor working with Brenda and with uh, uh, the other members of the Board of Selectmen, Tom Flynn. It's been a, a pleasure and honor getting to know you through this process and and uh, select woman uh, Nancy Lefkowitz. We've had a number of calls over the course of time and it's been uh, an honor getting to know you and I would love more to hear more about your uh, Tribeca Festival than anything in Fairfield. And at some point we will have that conversation. Uh, but it's been an honor serving the town and and working with um, uh, our commissioners. It's just been a great, an outstanding group of commissioners. I think most of them, if not all, uh, most of them are here today. Um, it's been a pleasure working with uh, Brian Caffarelli as chair, chair, Chris Brogan as the vice chair, Marlene Batista, who I talk to quite frequently, um, uh, as our secretary, um, RTM member Pam Iacono uh, has been a fount of information and, and very, very helpful and supportive uh, member throughout this process. Um, John Matola, who I knew a little bit from work I've done in Bridgeport over the years, um, his work as a member of the Board of Finance 
Um, and I believe a former member of the Board of Education was invaluable uh, to the work of the commission. Uh, John Wynn had been very, very involved in a number of civic activities. And uh, I have to say, it was kind of a secret weapon in helping uh, he and Chris Brogan helping me um, clean up some of the typos and other problems in this. But but all of the people on this commission had a very broad mindset um, and a very strong sense of civic um, commitment that they brought to this process. And I, I've worked with about 30 commissions throughout the state. Um, I just want to say that uh, you should be very proud of the commission, the bipartisan commission that um, you were dealing with. Um, also, Commissioner Gross, um, who um, uh, also made his contributions to this body. Uh, I also want to thank um, uh, Prue and, and Jen, um, who provided uh, me with um, a lot of administrative support. I'm very, very grateful to them. And Jim Baldwin, um, just having a second um, set of eyes uh, on this document throughout the process has been kind of a model of what I like to work with when, when there is a town attorney uh, who pays attention. I Believe me, I've been in towns where town attorneys and corporation councils just let this process slide. And, uh, and uh, I'm very, very grateful to Jim for his active participation. So I think, uh, Prue, have you changed the presentation or should I put mine up on the screen? Is it not showing? I'm seeing um, the last right, slide just... that Brian had. Okay, let me just close this one then. Hold on, I'm sorry. I could. No, I could I'm start. Try let me start broadly. As... All right. Why isn't it close? Well, let me, Madam, uh, oh, hold on. I got it. I okay, I'll start okay, without the PowerPoint. Okay, here I go. I'm going to come with yours now. Then I'll start without the, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay, move it up to number 12. There we go, you're there. So I'm going to go over some territory that the chair just talked about a little bit, um, but let me talk broadly about what we did here. You have a charter that hadn't been looked at in, in over about a decade and a half. Um, it's a charter that we also spent a lot of time looking back at the historic antecedents in this charter to make sure that we weren't eliminating, if we were to eliminate provisions, any special act provisions that were useful or helpful to the town. And so when you see this charter, those of you in the public, in the legal community, in the political community, that have worked with this document, you're going to see a very different looking document. Uh, the document is also annotated so that you can look back and see what the historical antecedents are. I will point out, I wouldn't say it's completely annotated. I think we annotated back to the mid 1940s. Um, at some point, you might want to hire a, a law student to further annotate back to the 19th century um, because that could be useful, but it was not necessary in the process that we were going through this year. Um, so what we did with Article 1 in that spirit is we wanted to start the document with uniform standards. Um, the open meeting and record provisions that are in this section are currently in the Charter. They're repeated in the Charter multiple times in Articles 8 and, and 10. And what we did is we moved the standard to one place so that the standard would apply to all boards and commissions in the town, whether elected or appointed. Attorney uh, Med, excuse, excuse me one moment. I'm sorry. Can everybody else mute their phone so that um, there's no background noise so everyone can hear Attorney Mednick? Th thanks so much. We're having a little thunderstorm here in the New Haven area, but um, I don't know if that's the problem. But uh, I'll try not to be any more turbulent than I have to be. Um, so, so what we did is we tried to move the standards up front that apply throughout the document. One of the other standards that we moved up front is um, called standards of conduct, but that's basically your current Article 11, uh, which is um, standards in conduct, which is your ethical uh, standards. We moved to the front section right up front so that people understand the critical importance of that standard and the applicability of that standard to all officials in the community. Uh, we did add, based on um, uh, public uh, testimony and on some of the experiences um, that um, uh, members of the commission have had and just basically some of the trends in the country, 
some new provisions regarding order and civility. Uh, very careful. There was some really good testimony at the public hearing that we took into account uh, to emphasize that these provisions are designed to underscore, to facilitate, and to bolster public participation and public participation in the uh, deliberation process in town. Um, and we added uh, some language that was recommended by at least one speaker uh, from the REL Institute regarding that important um, element of civility. But the civility section goes beyond simply conduct at meetings. I don't think Fairfield's had a history of problems at their meetings, but one of the other things we do is we talk about having a, um, um, a, a safe work environment for the employees at Town Hall, um, at the Memorial Hall, the various facilities that you have, but also for the citizens who come to visit at Town Hall. So it's a two-way street and the standards of, of, of um, good conduct kind of apply both directions um, in terms of just providing a good experience for members of the public in public places and vice versa. Um, what we also did in this section, you will see uh, we have a series of definitions. Um, the charters had definitions that are captured throughout the document, but what we tried to do is capture the common terms that are used in the charter in the definition, definition section so a member of the public can see a capitalized word and understand that there is a common meaning for that word throughout the document. One of the significant reforms that we made there, uh, Brian talked about, the chair talked about a moment ago, was the elimination of any mandatory newspaper publication requirements um, only if the um, state statutes or the federal law, depending on what you're operating under, mandated do you have to have a newspaper notice. Newspaper notices are very expensive, and the world has changed in terms of the kind of notices that can be expected. The town can still decide. The RTM can establish a standard. The Board of Selectmen can establish a standard. The town clerk can establish a standard where they believe that newspaper publication, whether it's daily or weekly, is the, the appropriate place to go. It is among the places you can advertise, but not the only place you can advertise. So that's kind of a summary of Article 1. I don't know, Madam First Select Woman, do you want me to stop at the end of each article or do you want me to just run through? Um, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm going to ask the board. I, I think it might be more productive. Obviously, I've been um, uh, watching mostly after the fact your meetings um, on Fair TV. So I've seen all of them um, and have read everything. But I think it might be helpful if we did stop after each section and I opened it up for questions for um, the board just to, so that no one forgets or it might be, I think it might be more productive. Okay. Well, Thank we're you. at the end of article one. Okay. So uh -huh. I'm going to open it up to the board for any questions for attorney Mednick or uh, chairman Caffarelli or anyone on the commission. Nancy, Tom, do you have any questions on this section? You know, I don't have any questions per se on this section, although I do have a lot of questions based on what's been shared. And I too have spent uh, the last week watching, in some cases, rewatching, reading. Um, so I actually have 30 pages of notes. Um, so mine are both in the weeds questions and, and attorney Mednick, um, you know, I want to reiterate, you know, thank you for your time that we've spent talking about this. And, and of course, I want to get to the specific thanks of the commission. But for me, mine are, are bigger, broader points. Um, I do have some in the weeds questions. So I, I don't know, I sort of put it back to you because I don't want to derail the presentation itself. Right. So if you don't have, let's do it this way. If you don't have any specific questions on this section and as we move forward, specific sections that are actually related to that section, I would say hold. Yeah. Um, and then maybe you will going forward. Yeah. There'll be a section that, you know, you do have some of uh, something that you want to ask about. And I would say that for Tom as well. And then at the end, um, then you can talk about broader things, but I think it might be more helpful, not just for our board, but if anybody uh, who's currently watching this right now 
or watches it after the fact can kind of relate to each section what you're you know well, asking. No, some broad comments to me that I definitely have comments on, but I think that I'm happy to go back to them. Do you know what I mean? So the presentation sure. itself is not, but of course I have questions about the things you reference. So let's try it the way you just suggested and okay. hopefully it makes sense. So okay. So Tom, do you have any questions on this section, Article One? Yeah, no, I wanted to say that I actually, um, we spent a fair amount of time going through this and uh, I thought this this section was well done with, I was glad to see the open meetings and that cleaned up the records. Uh, I was glad to see the standards of conduct and, and rules of order and civility um, addressed. I thought that that was important. So I appreciated the efforts on this section. Thank you, thank you, Tom. It's making me since you brought that up, if I could. Um, one of the things I had asked for in my initial commentary back when we were given the opportunity in October, um, I will start by saying that I really do appreciate the work that has gone into this after having revisited, in some cases revisited, but watching for the first time. I appreciate how much work goes into this. Um, I shared my concerns about the specific makeup of the group early on based on um, my inability to have meaningful participation in the selection of it. But I wished you well, and I continue to wish this group well, and I do above all else know how much goes into this. And as the um, co-chair of the Racial Equity and Justice Task Force, and having been on the receiving end of some of that language and vitriol, I know it's really hard to to be serving as a volunteer for something that you're really just trying to do good for the community. So I say all of this, um, understanding that and, and with deep appreciation and thanks to this group. Um, but that being said, you know, I do have a lot of questions. As I alluded to, I have 30 pages of notes here on the civility clause itself. Um, one of the things I had asked for early on was a, a preamble statement. And this civility clause to me does not really uh, uh, talk about what I had hoped to see, which was a statement of who we are, where we want to go. Um, it does not, you know, you reference workplace safety. And I think one of the things that I had also mentioned early on was an acknowledgement of um, some sort of statement of equity and racial inclusion. And I think that this language as it is, is so broadly inclusive that it excludes the very thing that it could do, um, which for a small, you know, a percentage of, of residents here could be inclusive. So out of the gate, that for me is, is an opportunity lost, um, is an opportunity not to kind of have that mission statement of who we are. I think this presentation in some ways is doing a better job of that than where the charter itself landed. Um, the newspaper notice brings up a point um, for me, which is I polled a lot of people this weekend, very unscientific, and not a lot of people knew that this was going on. And again, no lack of effort. So I hope you take this constructively, um, both in the at the administrative level and as a, as a commission, People really aren't paying attention and you do best efforts in the newsletter and you make it public and you you do all we can. And yet not a lot of people are paying attention and it's a frustration of trying to get people engaged. We see it in every domain of public service. But that being said, the newspaper um, is one thing that I think people don't read email. They don't necessarily check the websites. They don't have access. And one of my biggest concerns um, is that for something so massive and a once in a decades undertaking, not a lot of people are aware that it's happening. And again, no fault of this group because I know we're all doing the best we can. But for me out of the gate, another concern is that we're making a really big determination on something that we've gotten very little public input on. And I have more questions on that. So again, I have 30 pages of notes so I could keep going, but that's at least an initial response. Okay, um, thank you, Nancy. You know, I, I as you uh, alluded to, um, you know, I put in a fair amount of effort. I put this in, I think, literally every newsletter since they started uh, trying to encourage our community. The newsletter um, does reach a large portion of our community. I would suggest that it actually reaches far bigger 
portion than newspapers. Uh, people do read our newsletter. I actually did a little informal poll myself asking people. And people said, um, yeah, I saw that in your, your newsletter. And, uh, you know, I honestly, uh, I feel like that's more for elected officials who have to live under it. And they're like, and not to be rude, but they're like, I don't really care. So that was my feedback. I did the diaper drive this weekend with uh, Representative Devlin and a lot of people came by and they, they said, you know, I, I don't know what to even say because I, I'm not sure what our charter is or what it does. And so I think, you know, I think in general, our people are busy, they're working, they're taking care of their families. Um, and let's face it, like I wrote in my newsletter, the charter is a pretty dry thing. It's not a, not an exciting document that, you know, your average everyday citizen um, um, is going to be engaged in. And I can remember when Ken Flato opened it up back in 2006, you know, I only came to one or two meetings because I would, wanted to talk about the Board of Ed changes um, because I th I was interested in that section of it as an elected official at the time. Um, so I, I, I don't know what else we could have done to engage the public. Um, you know, we tried really hard uh, to get it, to get, you know, feedback. Um, and I just think that um, by people who are sort of under the umbrella of the charter who have to live under it as elected officials probably are more engaged than um, the average everyday citizen. I would offer um, just as two possible recommendations, a townwide survey and a mailing in addition. And I would also push back and say it is dry. And yes, the people who are serving under it I see this as, again, a once in a decade opportunity to really have to be something that is a reflection of who we are and where we want to go. And it is our rule, bu rule book and code of conduct or code of laws that we have to live by as a community. So I would push back on that and say that it really does impact the broad community. And we have an obligation to the 62,000 people that live here in part because they aren't paying attention. But because we represent these constituencies and maybe they're not coming and speaking up, but, you know, again, I think we, we do have that obligation to really be stretching this to its maximum. And, and to that end, I think um, everything that we can do, and it's not just about the, you know, the newsletter, which again, I know it does have broad reach. It's, it's doing everything we can, kind of leaving no stone unturned because this is gonna be the book that governs and guides us for the next decade. So Nance, do you wanna do a written, mailed, townwide newsletter? I think that's one thing that we should talk about. I think that would be a great way to um, reach people that either aren't clicking through the full newsletter or going onto the website. I just think, again, no stone unturned. I think spending a little bit of money here to, to um, or a little additional time and effort. And I, I don't mean to belittle what goes into that. Um, I just think that get, reaching people to, to make sure they under, even if it's just so they understand what's at stake here. So I see uh, Brian, uh, Chairman Caffarelli has his uh, hand hand up. Yeah, and, and forgive me if this is inappropriate, but I, I didn't know if we were to answer some of these questions that were being raised, and I would like to address this one if that's a, a if that's okay. Sure, go right ahead. So certainly, um, share your sentiment, um, Select Woman Lefkowitz. We really um, were seeking the public's involvement, and in, in addition to the two statutorily required meetings to to have with the public, we had additional ones um, along the way. I think at pivotal moments throughout the process. Uh, we we kind of we did everything within our efforts to publicize it. I I only wish that the other boards and government agencies, boards, commissions that we reached out to, in turn um, reacted like the first selectman's office did in sending out these newsletters. Um, we did send emails to all the representatives throughout town and did not see a real um, yield in their constituencies turning out. In the public, we did hear from the actual um, members of some of those boards themselves, but in turn soliciting their their help and in, in getting the word out um, was a was not successful. 
but again, we did we did endeavor to have the public engaged. Um, we're certainly happy when they did show up either in person or at the you know the WebEx or through the many many emails that we received. But it was not for lack of our desire or efforts to get the public there um, and try and engage them. And I and I agree with you. There was no money spent, but um, perhaps that could have been part of the cure. But thank you. I, I want to follow up to Thank make you, sure uh, you Brian, um, Sorry. Nancy. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to address like I hope that anything I say today is viewed through the lens of really just trying to be constructive and, and thoughtful. And there's going to be so many things that I'm going to say that are um, not in agreement with what's before us, but it's really from a place of trying to be constructive to get to answers. Um, so when I ask questions or make that comment. I don't want you to feel that I am putting you in a position of having to defend except to say, so it is meant to be constructive. So I, I really want to make sure you hear that. Um, but it does lead me to talk about something which is, you know, at the last public hearing, and I really want to encourage people to speak out. There was language used from all political parties that was really disconcerting. Um, and the Democratic Party, not I don't I don't remove the Democrats from this. There was a lot of language that was really concerning, and um, you know, be, people being called out for speaking up. And I just want us, the three of us, as the board of selectmen, to encourage people to comment because what some people might have been saying, and I asked Attorney Mednick about this, it might have been offensive to some. But if it's wrong, then we have an opportunity to to sp to, to call out what was wrong and what was being said. Um, and I think that there's a lot of confusion and I'd like to go back to some of those points at some point, what was said. I mean, I, I heard words like vile and I think we have to stop some of that and figure out what was so egregious in what was being said and correct the record. And I hope we'll use this opportunity to say, well, some people insert, you know, said this about it, but it's wrong because of this. So I think there's just some, for me, broad, broadly speaking, I would love to be able to go through and ask some pointed questions because. So, um, yeah. Can I, so, can I, I jump just, in for a second? Jump in for a second. It's all right. So our meeting um, started at four. It's four forty-three. We are literally on Article One. I I I I appreciate your your um, just you know sharing your opinions about things happening at different times or other people saying things. But as you stated, this is a document of serious nature. It is our charter. Um, the commission spent nine months reviewing it um, at many, many meetings. I want to try to, I would like to focus us on the substance of the language in the charter, the actual changes that were made, and have discussions as a board about those actual changes. Um, and then I guess at the end, if people want to make, if board members want to make, you know, broad comments about other things that, that aren't actually about the actual language. Because I think what's important is that we need to actually talk about the changes in the document, how they're different from the current charter, what do they mean, and how will they impact how our government runs. And so I just want to kind of focus on that because we could literally be here till midnight talking about feelings and opinions, and I want to make sure we're focused on the language. Um, so I'm going to... Um, if there's no if there's no actual comments on the article one comment, you know, uh, if if you're unhappy with it, you think it's not appropriate, you think the language is wrong, um, I'd like to have um, Attorney Mednick move on to the next article. My broad problem is that it's hard for me to parse out what is with this red line document, which I got, which and I appreciate it being printed out, but it it's really hard to know what the changes are, what language is different, what language is removed, how it's organized. I set up the way I did in context because some of that, it, it's not about opinions and feelings. It's trying to get past that so I could get to the substance of what was being said. I was trying to look past the vitriol and I still am at a place where I really can't fully analyze and understand 
where the changes are from one document to the next. The red doc, the red line is confusing. It's, I don't know where things are. I literally tried to go from the old document to the new document. I listened to all the things. So I want to have comments. It's just, to me, it's so clunky that unless we're literally doing a so line by line. Maybe, maybe um, if we can hand it back over to attorney Mednick and he, uh, Attorney Magnet, can you, you know, could we move on to the next article if there's no further comment on this specific piece? And then with in mind with uh, select woman Lefkowitz is talking about, she doesn't feel like she can follow along the red line document. She doesn't know what changes. Maybe you could just sort of keep that in mind as we move forward. Yeah, let me just say two or three things. Uh, let me comment on that first of all. Um, the red line is almost impossible to read. I, I'm not going to disagree with her, but there's a way to read it. And if people were following the process incrementally throughout the process, you, you will see at the bottom of each page, the derivation of each of the sections. Uh, there are not a lot of substantive changes. We have moved things around in the document so that there are more organizational cohesion. We'll emphasize where we did make changes uh, but the red line will just simply show that there were some substantial wholesale sh sections that were moved around. Um, this happens when you restructure a document. Uh, it'll be very, very difficult to do a line by line red line, um, but we have the annotations clearly will take you into um, each of the sections that were changed in the document. So, um, and I'll try to highlight the substantive changes. I think that's what we tried to do in our transmittal letter and what we tried to do in the um, um, in this presentation. What Let I still, think. I sorry to, to go back to your point. I still, I see the annotations there, but what's still unclear is what was voted on? What had unanimous support? How did we arrive at certain things? The, the why the of minutes, it? The, the minutes of the meeting will say all that. that, that, that that's not normally, I've done 30 of these. We've never in a charter document documented the votes in section right. by section votes. But, what but was unanimous? Is, what wasn't unanimous? Um, but, my, but my point is, and, and I had brought this up, it's really, it, it's hard to ask the community to engage. And again, I did listen to the meetings. I did follow the minutes. It's very hard, hard to ask the, com the community to vote on something without sort of that knowledge and they're not going to go back. So uh, if I have to be succinct, if you need very, two very specific things, I would say that for me, the absence of a preamble and the, um, sorry, and the, the, uh, the rules of order and civility, it's, it's a lost opportunity. So I made my comments. You're before. talking to somebody who's a big supporter of preambles, but um, the commission, um, I think moved directly into the substance of the document um, in this particular in this particular transaction. So let me just say two other things as well. This is your constitution. This is the constitution of your town. This is not an ordinance. And what we try to do in charter revisions, in the modern charter revisions, is not to tie the hands of the local elected officials, give the board of selectmen the ability to do the things there obligated to do the Board of Finance, the RTM, the other bodies all have uh, an ability to do certain things, um, for example. And, and so it's really, really important to understand it in that context. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we moved things around. And it is a difficult document to uh, maneuver, but I believe that the, uh, that the article by article breakdown does emphasize the things that were changed. Um, the red line will look like there's much more change than there is in this document. So let me continue on Article 2 if I can. Um, be good. Thank what we you. did here, again, is provided some level of clarity. Um, one of the points that we make in this charter is that Title IX of the general statutes generally applies to the conduct of elections where um, your processes don't address things um, that the special act provisions don't address things. They are governed by Title IX. You have some very specific provisions in there that uh, go back to the uh, special act, but there was no statement about the coverage of Title IX if the special act does not state the, um, uh, the standard. Um, we made a very clear delineation of um, 
who the elected officials are in the town. In the current charter, they're found in several different articles. We consolidated them all in Article 2 so you can get to see who they are. We, I think they stated earlier there was a change of term for the Board of Ed. There is no change of term for the Board of Ed. What we did is with the four-year cycle, where the four, the class of four cycle, we modified it slightly so that you would have more competition. The way the current charter was written, both parties nominate two people and, and they all get elected. So there's really no competition. What we did in response to public uh, issues that were raised in public comment, both in our, in our grid, at the public meetings that Chair Caffarelli talked about earlier, we decided to um, move to a 3-1 model where both parties nominate three, uh, but the majority party can win up to three seats and the minority party uh, would get one seat and that would increase competition for those seats on the board of ed. So that is a substantive change. Uh, RTM size uh, was talked about um, that uh, there was a, a determination to reduce the size of the body from the current up to 56, you have a 40 member body by, by rule of the RTM to a 30 member body selected from 10 districts. That is another substantive change in the document. I will point out that public hearings have a purpose. And at the last public hearing, there was an outcry regarding minority party representation and the commission heard the, um, heard the public and made a change so that minority party representation is no longer included in the proposal that the commission is made, making to the Board of Selectmen. So those are the major changes in Article 2. I have a couple of questions. Okay, are you done, Attorney Medic, with this uh, presenting yes, this section? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll open it up to the board. Nancy? Um, what happens on the board of Ed? I don't, unless I'm not following the language here, if an unaffiliated uh, voter or resident wins, if someone who's unaffiliated? The way minority party representation uh, works, and it's a really good question. Thank you very much. Um, it's a misnomer. Um, it makes it sound like you're guaranteeing seats for the minority party. But the way it works, it's a cap on the majority party. Uh, if you read the statute carefully, you'll find that it only takes into account, it only comes into play once you achieve a majority of one party. So once the Democrats receive three seats or the Republicans receive three seats, the next person running who is not a member of the party that has achieved the majority is elected to the body. If that person is a petitioning candidate, that person is elected. If, if, if it's a minority party, if the Democrats have the majority and, and the minority party is the Republicans, it's a Republican. It could be working families. It could be Green Party. It could be any number of alternatives, uh, but they, it cannot be a member of the party that wins the majority. It'd be the first person who is not a member of the, quote, majority party would take that seat. So unaffiliated voters could actually uh, qualify. Um, so I, I actually had a question. I'm, again, trying to parse through my own notes. Um, in, in the definition section, I would love to understand how we arrived at some of them, just because, for instance, the definition of contracts changed. And I'm so I'm going back because I am just getting caught up. Um, so I, I'd love to understand that. Um, and also, I, I want to make note that I'm against reducing the size of the RTM by charter to 30. Um, I know we've received a lot of comments on that um, and want to state for the record that I appreciate that you heard from a lot of experts and spent time, but I don't understand the next step, the, the substance of why you changed it. And I guess a lot of my questions come back to the why of something. I don't feel that you took that information from the experts and then sort of put it through the next lens of, of why. Um, if you want to have a robust committee structure, as one example, I think the, the fastest way to not ensure that is to reduce your size of the RTM. So in a town of 62,000, it, it may work for other towns and they're not listed on that, that sheet, but I haven't heard the case for why it would work here. So I want to state that for the record. 
Um, and then if you could answer that contract question for the definitions. It's a it's a definition that, that I have developed over the years working in different communities that uh, kind of covers um, most of the types of contracts that you have within a community. It's a pretty basic definition of a contract. It could be expanded. Um, it's including but not limited to the RTM if they want to as a legislative body can adopt an ordinance expanding the definition of contracts. The idea is to uh, develop a fairly broad delineation of contracts. Uh, these provisions have been expanded over the years because in some towns, um, there have been arguments that an MOU is not a contract, an MOA is not a contract, a quote, agreement is not a contract. So I've tried over the years to expand definitions to make sure that, and these are principally for legislative bodies, for the record, uh, that legislative bodies, uh, when they're requesting something, won't be stymied by an administration that says, well, it's not a contract. Um, that's the genesis of it. There's nothing unique for Fairfield. If you think that there's something unique for Fairfield that I've missed, let's let's amend it. Let's recommend a modification. And and Board of Ed is included in that. Was that where the was anyone from the Board of Ed or the superintendent or was anyone consulted for that? How did that all come about? Well, Board of Education contracts could be included because they, they have contracts. They're an agency of the of the town. This doesn't give us any special jurisdiction over their contracts, although candidly, their capital contracts are not their contracts, they're the town's contracts. Um, Multi-year contracts arguably um, are something that should be looked at as well uh, for boards of ed, but this does not change. Uh, this simply indicates in accordance with case law in the state of Connecticut, that structural and administrative issues, uh, boards of ed have to comply with the broad overall uh, structures of local government, whether it's uh, procurement, whether it's uh, employment procedures and all those kinds of things. They have a, they have independent bases. We don't control their budget per se, but the definition of contract is a uniform mm -hmm. definition across the town. And um, and I do appreciate that from what you're saying um, from a, a legal perspective and what the town is kind of on the hook for. But my question is really specific. Did you talk to, did the commission consult with anyone on the Board of Ed? And, and if yes, what was the understanding? Was a vote taken on this one? This is, I just think some people are gonna really, if they understood what was in there, would there would be pushback or certainly questions about it. So I just think we have to be prepared to understand. So if you could get into Can that. Can I just jump in a second? Is this on our, are you asking this question in regards to Article 2? We're back it, to Article I 1. I don't know what clause. Sorry, this here. goes back to definition of contracts. I get Article 1. Oh, this is Article 1. Okay, sorry, we sorry. had moved on and I still had an outstanding question. Okay. I just, for clarification purposes. Yes, sorry, thank you. I okay. Can you go back, can you go back the page and show it? Pro, well, can you you'd have to look at the con the charter itself um because I don't yeah. think the definition That's is true. in article one yeah I don't think we have the definitions they would be in your charter if you look at the charter uh, page two <coughs> of section 1.4 c5 Pro, do you have the contract the the charter I do not, not here. Uh, I would add as we're looking, I mean, I think as a, a body that the Board of Ed is a state, is an agency of the state, unless I'm misunderstanding it. And there are privacy issues that I would be questioning. And and again, this is just the definition know, of contract. This doesn't- right, But do I'm just that. saying in terms of, in terms of what, the, what the town is able to do when entering certain contracts. I'm just trying to think about what it would mean to be able to do that and where we would. Well, is there a specific provision of the charter that raises that issue? This is a definition. This doesn't give anybody any power or any rights. It's simply a defined term. Right, but if contracts so now encroach, into... So the question I have is, how does this encroach on any particular agency? It's a definition that right. is across the board for all agencies of the town. Right. So again, I'm not asking, I'm trying, I'm asking because I want clarification, not because I'm trying to stick anyone in a gotcha. If I have the question, believe me, there are going to be lots of people who follow as we discussed. So the question is, if it can be defined this way, 
then there mm -hmm. isn't anything protecting certain contracts because by this definition, so that's where my question comes in. Not that it's necessarily a specific clause, but when you include it, when you define it to include board of education contracts, that's sort of where my bigger concern comes in. We can move on. I'm so just using it you as a concern. you think the board of education should be excluded from a definition of contracts that applies to every other town agency? I'm saying in here. I'm not sure what you're getting at. That it's a new clause. And so I'm trying to understand why it was put in when it wasn't before, what it accomplishes and what is the rationale now for when it wasn't previously. I'm just trying to understand. That's why I asked the question, was the board of ed consulted? Was the superintendent, how did we arrive here? How did it make its way here? Because if we're looking at this as the rule of, of you know, the, the land here, that's why I'm trying to understand it. I don't know how to answer your question. I thought I answered the question. I told you why it was there. It doesn't invoke anything. It doesn't encroach on anyone's rights. There's statutory rights to redaction on documents. There are privacy rights. This is simply a definition that does not, it's not a power clause at all. It's simply a definition. Uh, if you don't think it should be, the Board of Education should be um, included in it, then you might recommend that we delete the Board of Education and let them decide what the law is going to be for the Board of Education. But it's a, it's a term that was designed to apply to all departments. It, it's a relatively innocuous definition. If you think that there's but something in here that's Just for clarification for Nancy, yeah. we vote on these a lot at our Board of Selectmen meetings, as you know. Definitely. I'm saying I am raising it as a point to be thought about. It's a question and concern I had. It wasn't there previously. I, I hear you. I hear the words you're saying. I understand the words you're saying, but I am saying it's a new addition so and it, one that seems significant. So that that's, you know, we can move on from it. I am raising it as a question and as a concern. Very good. Um, go ahead, attorney Mike. This is Look, this is this is town attorney Jim Baldwin. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, sorry. I I'm, I'm having video issues so I'm I'm calling in by phone, but um it might it might help you to understand uh, Nancy that the the current charter uh, has language in it which speaks to contracts and speaks to contracts uh that are those of the Board of Education already. So it's not as though this is uh this is adding anything, as Steve said, other than further clarification of what a contract is to help clarify even that existing mm -hmm. section of the charter. So, so in that sense, it's really not new. It's it's uh, it's just providing more information and more clarity. So, okay. so the the current okay. charter has a section which addresses board of ed contracts, and and uh, and it's very big. And uh, while this doesn't change any of their substantive rights uh, with the, uh, the Board of Ed contracts generally as provided by statute and otherwise, um, it, it does at least help broaden the understanding. So I think it's, it's most appropriate. I don't know if that helps clarify the situation no, for you. It does. And I think, you know, attorney, I wanna remind attorney Mednick, I'm asking these questions because I, have outstanding confusion or concern or I'm representing a point of view of some, at least some constituency. So, uh, you know, it's not to be argumentative, it's to really get to a better place of understanding. Sure, no, and I, I hope I hope that uh, helps. It does, it, thank that. you. I, I mean, I'd be curious what section you're referring to, but perhaps, <clears throat> you know, that's- well, I'll a, tell you, I can tell you what section he's referring okay. to. It's um, Article 6, Section 1, uh, under the Board of Selectmen, C1. And um, there it talks about uh, the power of the Board of Selectmen, which this does not address, which does not include acting on behalf of the Board of Ed. But then it simply defines contracts as meaning all contractual relations of the town, including without limitation, purchase contracts, lease contracts, service contracts. That's the provision that we pulled out as a defined term that was currently in the charter and just expanded it a little bit. But it doesn't get in to the issues of who has the power to assign a contract or move a contract or anything like that. But it didn't it exclude the Board of Ed? Sorry, I mean, I'm just- The definition did not exclude the Board of Ed. That's, 
How are the board of selectmen to approve the contract excluded the board of ed? Okay. So that's not part we, of the definition. We can move on. I have raised my concerns here. Good. Thank you. Thank you to the town attorney. So move on to article three. Yes, thank you. Um, I no. I just want to make sure it was noted. And if there's any, I had asked specifically for data in terms of the reducing the size. So for me, that's going to be a tough one. And I don't know if it's the kind of thing you want to come back, but I did ask specific questions about. I'm happy to I, defer to members of the commission. That was a policy decision based on comparative analysis of other towns similarly situated, but I'll defer to the chair, the vice chair, other members of the commission, the secretary, yeah. other members of the commission who are here. Yeah, Mr. Caffarelli, this is Tom. I'm I'm sorry to interject. Uh, Mr. Caffarelli, if you could address um, the size of the RTM, why the committee reached the conclusion it did, what the benefits the committee saw to that conclusion versus the concerns with leaving it the way it way it is in terms of size. I do have one overall concern. Um, that was new to new to me about it, but I'll, I'll save that for the moment and just ask your for your answers on the other questions. Thank yeah, you. Tom. I'm happy to, and I think that a lot of this can be gleaned from one of our meetings, the documents, and really in the letter that we wrote to you. Um, and we looked at many different forms of government. I think that we all. Um, understood that Fairfield in terms of the size of the town that it is was an outlier in the size of its legislative body, notwithstanding Greenwich, which everyone loves to refer to. But if you look at the chart um, that I believe was on page three to four of the transmittal letter that goes through the top 15 towns, it talks about the top town with 148,000 people having 20 people on its legislative body. And the average of, of the towns are less than that. With Fairfield, you know, falling at 61,000 people with 40 people on its legislative body. And we're sandwiched right in between uh, a 64,000 person town with nine people and a 61,000 person town with 15 people. Again, notwithstanding uh, Greenwich, which is 230 people on their RTM. And then when you look at the RTM, um, we are six communities in the state, excuse me, that is still governed by an RTM legislatively. Uh, we are, we are, you know, notwithstanding Greenwich and Darien outliers there. And because everyone else is doing it, doesn't make it right, certainly not. But we did hear from other communities. Um, we recognize the fact that Fairfield is a growing community and wanted to, you know, in line with our charge of looking to see uh, things that could be done to make the government more efficient, efficient and accountable. Um, it was one thing that we looked at and we found that by and large, smaller legislative bodies were more accountable to their communities when and we looked at doing something which i think was radical and and suggested at the beginning of this uh meeting today that if it was something that we wanted to as a town pursue changing the form of governance it's not something we discovered a charter revision commission could do on its own within the time frame that it had um, that it was something that needed to be studied and the groundwork needed to be laid well in advance of the commission being constituted and gaining some consensus. That being said, there was, there was an overall consensus that a smaller body would be more accountable. And so with taking a step towards that, which was similarly done as most people on this WebEx understand, our RTM was reduced from 50 members to 40 members, albeit through a different vehicle. Um, this was taking another step. <laughs> I think that it would be helpful as Select Woman Lefkowitz has uh, indicated an appetite for perhaps a survey, but our informal survey, I should say, but the ones that you know I and others that I know of, um, you know, most people don't know who their RTM members are, the 
the town council, when there's one town council person, they know who it is. Um, so, you know, we did hear a lot of arguments, pro and con. Uh, definitely the con was uh, much more vocal and um, considered these policies with a lot of background materials, a lot of experts, a lot of testimony from other municipalities. And, you know, went through our own homework and came up with uh, a decision um, mostly as a group. I, I think that if you look back to it, I don't know, about five, of, five out of six or six out of six agreed on changing it to the 30. Very, let me cut it. Yeah, let me cut it very, very simply. What are the three benefits, somebody on the commission, what are the three benefits to the town of having a smaller RTM? How does the town benefit? That's that's the question I'm asking. I know what other towns do. I know I, I'm not quite like I've never been interested in being in another town. I just want to know how did the commission feel that the town benefited? And I'm not even saying the commission's wrong. I just want to know the thought process that went behind. How does the town benefit by having a smaller RTM? Well, I think I've just answered that for you. That it's the only thing I've heard was that less representative is more accountable to the townspeople. That's the one thing I heard. Is there anything else? I think that it also makes. I, I would defer to other members of the commission at this point. Um, I would also add to that question, if I may, which is um, how are they? I, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Can I just open it up then? Um, um, to the commission, um, I the only, I'm the one commissioner who has actually served on the RTM is um, uh, yeah. Representative Iacona. Maybe you would like to weigh John in here. Oh, Sorry, you I'd be too, happy John. to speak. That's right. Actually, I think you and I both served together on the RTM. <laughs> Um, and Com Commissioner Brogan, I believe, served as well, but, um, you know, a little while ago. Um, thank you for the question. To answer uh, Selectman Flynn, um, for me, it increases accountability. It gives you an opportunity to know who your rep is because there's less of them. Um, and it's going to allow for more enriching conversations and dialogue um, rather than having a very large impersonal body. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that that's a step in a positive direction for, I'm going to say it, and people are going to hate me for it, a city the size of Fairfield because that's really what we are. We, we are a city. And I fight it tooth and nail every day, but, but you know, I, I wanted to live in a town, and it's a great town, but we're a city. And when you add in the university population, we're pushing 75,000 people here. Well, we're like the size of Norwalk. And I think that, you know, we keep pressing that out of our minds, uh, and we need to do a little bit better there. So for me, it was those things, the accountability, um, recognizing who your representatives are, and um, enriching the dialogue uh, on the town's business. Uh, Thank you. John, John Wynn, if I could jump in, I have some supplemental thoughts. Sure, sure. go ahead. So um, a few other points, and I fully agree with the accountability. But what we also found was across the board on pretty much every constituency here in town of the need for improved management, hence the town administrator role. In general, a town manager or town administrator, which is everyone recognizes the need for, doesn't work well with too large of a legislative body. The success cases there typically have a smaller legislative body, which is we were trying to take a step towards that to continue the work that had been started by the RTM previously. So by moving further would give us the opportunity to further test how well we work as a legislative entity with 30 members, which will allow us to move further into town administrator type of interaction, which no town administrator that we found would be interested in working with an exceedingly large legislative body. So that's a key one. An another one was a sense that with large legislative bodies, there is the unfortunate opportunity for people to hide in the crowd. They don't stand on their own beliefs and their own opinion. They'll just go along with whatever consensus there might be from either political or other things. 
And by having a smaller legislative body, people are more accountable and will take a stand on things that are important to them. Okay. Can I ask a follow up to that? I just ask everyone who's not speaking to please mute their uh, uh, computers and phones, please. Thank you. Uh, well, who wanted to follow up? Sorry, I did. Can can I just is there anybody else on the commission that wants to weigh in on this item um, before I move back to the board of selectmen? I thought John Matola had his hand up, Madam. Uh, okay, I, I I'm sorry. With this screen here, it's hard to see everybody. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I, although I greatly respect my fellow commission's uh, opinions on this, I I voted against this. I was the one member who um, thought that we should. Um, if we were going to reduce it under the charter, it should go from the current 56 to 40. Um, I think, the, I guess, let me point out a couple of things. I, I, I think the reasonings that you've heard about reducing it are, are more based on commissioners' subjective feelings about the issue, as opposed to some real objective data that they could use to measure why we should make this change. Um, and the, compar the comparators where you talk about size of legislative bodies, they're all a different form of government. They're all mayor council uh, forms of government where you don't have a board of selectmen. So in the mayor council form of government, the council takes on more of those duties that a board of selectmen take on. So there's there's the big difference here. So you you tend to have those smaller legislative bodies in the mayor council um, format. So the comparison isn't a good one in my opinion. Um, I mean, I, I, I come from the viewpoint that if it isn't broken, you know, then we shouldn't try to fix it. And so that, that's where I came from with respect to we should keep it where it is. And the, the, the RTM should have the ability to regulate itself. So that, that's where I came from. Um, certainly respect my commissioner's opinions uh, on this issue, but I felt that uh, we should keep it where it is right now. Or actually the change would be from 56 to 40. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, John. John. Is there anybody else um, on the commission that wants to uh, speak on this item? Okay. I have one last. I have one follow up, and I know Nancy is waiting patiently. Can I have one follow up for Mr. Wynn since he was answering my question? Sure, of course. Um, Mr. Wynn, you said the town administrator. You referred to the position in working with a legislative body, but the town administrator wouldn't report to the legislative body. So why is that relevant? Because the town administrator would be interacting quite significantly with that legislative body and having too many people trying to interact in that fashion makes it quite challenging for the town administrator to follow the policy that's been set by the elected bodies in managing the town's interests. So the town administrator position is a position that Mr. Bremer is currently filling. Is that not correct? I believe um, he is. I, I don't really. Yeah, I think so. Day to day responsibilities. Yeah, so Mr. Bremer, Mr. Bremer. We tried to provide clarification in the uh, revised charter about that role. So I have yeah. a comparison of what that role, as it's defined in the charter, is to what Mr. Bremer's current responsibilities are. So, Mr. Bremer, you're on the phone. Um, I, at least I saw you earlier. I don't know if you still are. But if you are, what's your type of interaction with the legislative body on a day to day basis with the RTM? Is Tom on the phone? I am still here. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Hey, Tom. Hey, hey, Tom. How are you? Um, Good. Uh, currently, I have very little uh, interaction with the current RTM, although, you know, I, I do updates and that sort of thing when uh, asked to do so from the RTM uh, through uh, the office of the first select woman. But other than that, I, I really don't have much interaction with them on a day to day basis. Right. That's I, I didn't know. Thank thanks for the answer on that. I just wanted to clarify that one point. 
And uh, I'll turn it back over. I think Nancy was waiting pace. Uh, I just want to or, jump in for a minute, though. Yeah. I think, you know, I, in the beginning meetings, I know that the uh, commission and Brian, you can, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, or Attorney Mednick, but I know that the commission was really looking at um, um, eliminating the Board of Selectmen, having a more uh, either a, a town manager or a um, a chief elected official with more authority who would work more closely with the legislative body sort of in place of the Board of Selectmen. And typically this the, the models that they looked at had between I think 10 and 12 something to that nature legislative body that worked more uh, intimately with the chief elected official and in that regard um, and the CAO as well or the town manager if the town chose that I know I watched some meetings where there were um, presentations from public policy people from Sacred Heart and Fairfield View and, and cost and other things who said when the commission was talking about a town manager slash um, smaller legislative body type of government because they thought maybe the politics would be taken out of it. Um, they were quickly uh, told that um, town managers got fired uh, by legislative bodies a lot, depending on the change of the legislative body. So they sort of became political. Um, but I know that they were looking at a smaller body, you know, like I said, nine or 12 to work more intimately with um, the chief elected official and they were going to give that legislative body more powers. Um, there was a lot of pushback to that based on all those meetings that I watched. And I think the commission then decided to retain our current form of government, but slightly reduce the RTM size because 30 is not at all the number that they were originally looking at for a more intimate um, discussion, but to have a more sort of accountable to the voters. That's what I gleaned from watching your meetings in the beginning. And if I'm wrong, you know, if I mis misunderstood what I saw. Um. If I may, I've been quiet on the issue, Madam First Select Woman, but you really did watch the hearings. <laughs> and I did. And to, to answer, um, to, to, to add, answer Selectman Flynn's uh, question about the various reasons, um, Commissioner Flynn, Commissioner um, uh, Wynn, um, raised the issue about management, but the first select woman actually hit the nail on the head. As they were looking at these issues, as they were looking at the structure, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Article 4 um, to kind of move it. I know that um, that uh, select woman Lefkowitz has, um, has a question, but since it relates to the issue, is we were looking at the structure of your government as being a very diffuse, distribution of executive powers. Um, you have a number of elected bodies and uh, throughout the town, you even have two appointed bodies that pick department heads, police and fire. Um, the first elect person has a veto, uh, has to agree to it, uh, but you have this diffuse executive power that is, uh, that is distributed throughout your government. And as they were looking at this and they were looking at models, um, Back for a very brief period of time, there was a 4-3 majority uh, on the commission in favor of town manager, in, in favor of full-time professional management of the town. Um, there were people who testified uh, at our two official public hearings, at the many public comment meetings, in various informal ways that were in favor of keeping the RTM at the current size, 40 could be 56, but currently 40. Uh, but at the same time, we're in favor of town management. And we tried to explain that it really doesn't work that way. That if you want to move in the direction of more professional management, um, no manager is going to work for a, a board of directors in effect, that's what they are, that is comprised of 30, 40, 25, uh, whatever the number is, uh, they need to be looking somewhere at 15 or somewhere south of 15. Um, and so I think that as the commission was going through its deliberations, I think you ended up with kind of hybrid thinking that we were not going to make the, the commission was not going to make the um, significant shift away from the current form of government, but wanted to make a incremental shift 
um, as a message to everybody that if you want to move to the next stage at some point, recognize that you right now you're an RTM town, that you have to get used to the concept of perhaps having a smaller legislative body. So I think that was some of the thinking that went into it, uh, that if you went to an actual town manager form, not the current form um, uh, where, the, where the board of the RTM would be the board of directors. There'd be no, uh, there'd be no first select person. There'd be no board of selectmen. The legislative body would be the board of directors. It's not going to work at 30 or 40 members. It's probably not going to work at 20 or 25. Uh, so I think that that was some of the thinking that went into it, and I'll stand corrected if other commissioners um, um, are here and want to comment. Thank you, Attorney Mudnick. Um, does that help explain, uh, Tom, like where they were and what they were kind of going for? It, it, it explains some of the logic and some of the thinking. Um, and there's kernels of what I was looking for in there. I what, I don't want to hear that it's a step to go somewhere that we weren't prepared to go. I want to hear that there's a benefit to the town of a smaller legislative body. That, that's what I'm looking for. When the committee got together and said, you know, we, we aren't going to do this, but we want to go to 30. What was the obvious benefit? I think Pam actually came the closest to actually answering that. I think John tried and, and made some valid points. I don't particularly agree with the town administrator point, only because I don't think the town administrator has much to do with the legislative body right now. But I, I just want to hear on its own merits, why is 30 the right number? Um, I'll go to my other point, and then I'll let this lie for now and think on it. And my other point was, and I was surprised at this, I didn't know this. Um, I didn't know that the RTM actually voted on its own size. That was actually a surprise to me. Um, and shame on me for that. But it was. And I don't agree with that at all. I think that it should be set um, by by the charter um, as opposed to the RTM gets to vote, whether it's 56 or 40 or, or 48. I just don't think that's uh, I don't think that particular provision is appropriate. So I thank you for the time and the discussion. I'll I'll uh, I'll follow up from here and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um I, if I may just sure you know, I want to echo. I, I think I would I tend to agree with um Commissioner Matola here that in the absence of data, it it feels like a feeling um in in the sense of it makes smaller bodies make um are more accountable to the community. I don't yet have a sense of how, and I don't need to belabor because I've made my point clear, but I think that if I were to support this, I would really need to understand with data because I think, you know, smaller bodies, town administrators also can have representative town mu meeting. It's not mutually exclusive. So I'm not hearing anything that is data-driven rationale for the why. And I'd also be curious, was the RTM was there a, a sense of the body of, of what they wanted and what they feel? I mean, I agree. I will disagree and say, you know, I do think there are certain things that are broken about the way the RTM functions, but having served on it for one term, I don't think a smaller body would address those. And um, I think, again, it's a feeling, but a the accountability piece, having four and the fact that we feel that we are a city, you know, having... 10 little hamlets represented by four different people seem to kind of um, combat some of that. So again, I can move on, but for me to support it, I would need more data. Um, okay. Um, well, I'm, I, I, everybody's sort of weighing in. I, I'm just going to say that, you know, I, I did too serve on the RTM when there was 50 members. Um, I served on the board of ed. I kind of look at it Listen, I, I look at it like, um, you know, we have uh, two senators for each state. We have United States congressmen because no one can speak to their president, you know, directly. Um, and then in our state, we have state senators and we have representatives because it's not that easy to sit down and talk to your governor. I think in towns, it's a little different. Um, you know, I heard a lot about, you know, representatives um, 
are, are the people's voice. But I think that um, our community has always been, even though we are big, um, I think our community has always felt like they could reach out to their first select person um, and their government. Um, and they have uh, before me and, um, and during me. I mean, people call and email uh, town hall every single day uh, to share their opinions, to report a pothole, to tell that their street needs to be paved or there's a tree on the side of their property that's dead and needs to be removed or, you know, you name it, there's something. Um, so, I mean, listen, I think it might be easier for, a, listen, this is not for me, this charter, it, you know, it's going to be for our future. Um, I think that it's, it might be a more intimate re, uh, relationship for the uh, administration to work with a smaller legislative body. Um, I think that there might be some actual um, uh, benefits to that. Uh, but um, again, I, I, you know, I think that the legislative body in our town serves more uh, to provide ordinances and obviously uh, pass budgets and things of that nature. Um, so that's just my piece of it. Uh, I think either one, I thought people were very up in arms about when 50 got moved to 40. And I don't think we saw any really significant change um, to how our town operates. So I was uh, inclined to listen to that. Um, I don't see any data either way saying we, we, our town is going to suffer greatly with a reduction of 10 members across the entire town or that it is going to benefit greatly with 10 additional members. So I was keeping an open mind on it all the way through. I have a very specific question about ex officio voting members as I'm looking sure. here, if I may. Um, it says the RTM shall have for section, what is it? It's the ex officio B. It doesn't have mention of board of selectmen as ex officio. Is that a change? Town clerk, the first select person, town attorney, assistant town attorneys, the event they are electors, but no mention of board of selectmen. Are you taking away one of my jobs? Where is? I say that with a smile. Well, again, I just want to, for everybody, for the record, this is not all about us. This is about the future of our town. Of course, hopefully, of course. I'm joking. I'm joking. Be here. <laughs> yes, but that being said, if we have. The Board of Selectmen agree. I was saying that tongue in cheek. But I don't know what section are you referring to, Nancy. In Article so. 3, uh, 3, 2, two B. B. It says ex officio non voting members of the RTM. There's no mention of the Board of Selectmen. You see that, Attorney Mednick? I will point out, I believe that's an errata. I think that they should be in there. I don't know why that. They were excluded in there from that section. The board of select, per, the other two select persons should be ex officio non voting members of the RTM. So I would suggest that you make a recommendation to the Charter Commission that they add the other two select persons to the, um, is, to the, um, is there RTM. a formal process for doing that or is this considered that? This is the process. So let, let me explain something. Maybe we didn't do this at the beginning. Let me let me explain where we are in the process. What, the commission has filed its report with you. You now have the opportunity to go through it section by section. You have one required public hearing. You could have multiple, but you have one required public hearing. Then your job is to either approve, disapprove, approve in part, um, disapprove in part, uh, or make recommendations back to the commission. So let me give you two examples. This one, um, this was an obvious mistake. Uh, I have to point out an errata um, that should be fixed. And I, my recommendation is that you would recommend to the to the charter commission, unless the charter commissioner wants to point out that they did this intentionally, this might've uh, fallen out of there when we were moving, well, actually, and I know when it fell out, we were removing the board of selectmen from the charter. So the idea that the Board of Selectmen was not returned was a mistake. It should be there. You should recommend that they put that in there. One well, of the other areas, which was not in errata, but where the commission actually made a determination, is whether you want them to reevaluate having 30 members. 
uh, or 40 members, whatever uh, that may be. So your job now is to either approve, disapprove, approve in part, disapprove in part, or make recommendations for modifications to the um, Charter Commission. They'd have then 30 days to get back to you with those changes. They would be limited to those changes. So that there's any, if there's anything that the members of the Board of Selectmen want to discuss um, with the commission and want the commission to have, if there's members of the public that have issues that they want to raise, they need to be sent by the Board of Selectmen back to the commission. So you were clear in all of that, and I appreciate you reiterating it. My question is, I've we've already discussed several things, including my desire for a preamble, for instance. Is there a more formal process within the context of this meeting that it will go on record other than the minutes where I'm formally making that recommendation? Or at the end of it, is it a simple thumbs up, thumbs down? So that's what I'm unclear about. Well, you need to have a majority of the Board of Selectmen making the recommendations too. So you'd have to make a motion at some point uh, during or at the end of the meeting. I don't know what your procedures are, whether you wanna wait till the presentation is complete, but anything you wanna have go back to the commission would require uh, a consensus majority vote uh, of the body to go back to the commission for further consideration. Is it then appropriate to make a motion to hold all the motions until the end of the formal discussion so we can hear from the public? Or Madam First Select Woman, how would you like to? Hey. Let me think um, Attorney Baldwin raised his hand. I thought the way, listen, this is, um, you know, listen, they went through a lot of work. There was a lot of different stuff. I think there are a couple little, like, you just noticed, a, a, I would say a clerical mistake when they were going back and forth. Um, can everyone please mute their phones um, if they're not speaking because there's background noise um, in their computers. Um, any callers who are uh, calling in, can you please mute your phones? Um, but I, I would think that what we would do um, is obviously we have the chairman who's an attorney, we have attorney Medicare, we have the town attorney that we'd be taking notes of any of these items. And then I would assume that we would at the end make, um, you know, motions to accept any, you know, these changes. Um, I wouldn't think that it would need to go back to the charter revision because of a clerical error. Um, but um, I think that's the way we should probably uh, manage it. Uh, Brenda, just related to this one topic, Attorney Mednick, if you could go to section 4.2B subparagraph five, I believe that point is covered. It reads membership. Uh, this is regarding the board of selectmen, uh, select persons. Membership on boards, commissions, and committees, except as otherwise provided in section 811, each member of the board of selectmen shall be an ex officio member without vote on all town boards, commissions, and committees. So that right. might that might address the question that Nancy raised. And um, I'm sorry I didn't notice this in the document that would have alleviated the, the need to discuss to this extent, because I believe it's in there. So that would that would give me comfort that we could probably uh, just modify this as an errata correction, as opposed to a recommendation yeah. to the commission. The only thing this I is, would say, is, oh, sorry. Sorry, this is Town Attorney Jim Baldwin. I just wanna point out, I was about to point out uh, what the Commissioner Wynn just said, but I also wanna point out that this is the current language from the uh, current charter. And and I think that the uh, that, uh, select woman Lefkowitz's uh, point is a very good one. And that is also the purpose of this commission, which is to make this charter better and more clear. And so I think that uh, it, it is a substantive change in that sense. It's not uh, a, a leftover from a previous iteration that uh, had taken it out and now it, it remains out. It's actually out of the current version, but I think that it's a, a useful uh, thing to include in the new, new charter. And um, that's why we're here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Excuse me. I w if I may add to, oh, sorry. Hey, Jim, it's John Matola. I just read the current charter. Take a look at it. It, it, it says, Pulling it up right now. It says the selectmen are also ex officio members of the RTM 4.2A. So yeah. Just double check that, okay? 
Oh uh, yeah. Um, I it, I it's 4.2a in my version does not have that. That's amazing. I I can't explain that. Yeah, my, mine has so, it. I just pulled it up. So, so. yeah, no, no I, John, you're right. I see it. So so it is an errata, and so it is something that should be fixed. Yeah. I I uh, I, yeah, I, I pointed it. that out yeah. that it's in it's in the current charter. Okay. If Sorry. I may make a comment, and this is for the cynical among us, and it's it's not because I'm in assigning intent, but when I hear that there is a version, and I know it was an April version, having done the homework, where the board of, I think it's an April version, where the board of selectmen was not part of you know, moving forward, and it was part of one of the changes being considered. I would just be concerned that there are other areas and again, pointing it out because I won't be the only one that are there other areas where powers that once existed and, and we can get into this in the next section. But to me, it's not just about a clerical error. It's about wanting assurance that, you know, the powers and the duties that it hasn't changed and that where it might have been eliminated in a previous draft in all instances, it's either been restored or um, beefed up. So I just. Again, raising that as a point of concern or question or consideration. That's it. Where I go with this is if this was just a clerical error that was left out, what happens if we don't find another one? That's, that's my point. You're saying it more succinctly. Right. I, I would just say that I, you know, having watched all of their meetings, there was a lot of instances where this happened from prior iterations and, and such. I, I'm assuming that, um, and maybe I'm wrong, and Attorney Mednick and Attorney Baldwin, you can let me know. Um, I'm assuming you're gonna do a fine tooth comb on this um, to make sure everything lines up. Because obviously you're saying it's in one section, but it's not in another section. Um, my understanding was when you decided to keep the Board of Selectmen, um, you re, you know, you re, uh, put put back the way it was prior uh, so that it's the same as it was before. Um, and it, go ahead, Attorney Bettig. Well, before you vote on this, we will take another look through the document. This was a pure clerical mistake. The, the, uh, it was taken out during the period where we were removing the board of select persons from existence and and it was not placed back in here. And that was just a mistake. It was placed back in the other provision um, that uh, uh, Commissioner Wynn referred to, but I will do a double check um, between now and uh, whenever your final action will take place. Uh, and uh, so we'll, I will be more than happy to do that one more time. Thank you, Attorney Medic. I just want to assure the members of the Board of Selectmen that the if there are, um, if there are mistakes, they will be fixed, but there was no intent to remove the Board of Selectmen from uh, this provision. No, the intent was to remove them from the document. <laughs> well, that was different. That's a different issue. I would add. That's a different issue. Yes, I would add that that actually was a unanimous vote, too, to remove the Board of Selectmen, and it was uh, data-driven, too, and we looked at the voting histories and how often um, they they uh, voted not to approve a budget, which is really the context, and we looked at that. But it was also to try and in in cooperation with reducing the size of the legislative body, and found that it couldn't be done. So again, another time that we took analysis that if you watched it, you'd understand that we we used data, we used we used reporting from other towns, we used expert testimony from the, the university professors and came to conclusion and saw that maybe we weren't in the right we were in the right area and so i you know again i i would like to i would like for you to really consider all the documentation and sources that we use along this process and not just focus on one i all right, thank you, Brian. So I'm gonna just, um, I want us to move along a little bit because obviously we've got a lot to do. And I'm gonna just mention um, now, based on how this meeting's been going, um, that I'm assuming now <laughs> the public hearing meeting on Wednesday uh, may turn into a lot more discussion in the beginning. Um, Cause I, I was hoping 
that we were going to have, um, you know, some really um, focused discussion. And but so I'm thinking um, we may have to continue discussion, then have hearing, and we're going to probably have to come back the following week for um, a vote because I just I, I want to make sure we have enough time as all. Well. So I'm going to uh, hand it back to you, Attorney Medic. Do you want to proceed with the next um, article? Sure, happy to do so. Article four. Yes, thank you very much. The um, for the most part, we maintain status quo um, here, uh, and um, there is one significant addition um, in this section uh, that I believe was a result of the discussions at the time we were. Um, Going, we were looking at legislative authority um, since we were moving away from the Board of Selectmen concept, this concept of the $100,000 approval of $100,000 contracts that are exempted from procurement and solicitation requirements um, would uh, be subject to approval by <laughs> the Board of Select Persons, including Board of Education contracts in that case. Um, the, um, the the notion there was it would be a very limited group. I can't imagine there are very many contracts at the Board of Ed that are exempted from procurement uh, and solicitation requirements. And so um, uh, that is an additional authority that is granted to the Board of Select Persons um, under this charter. Um, in all other respects, there are no significant there are no changes there there may be a few clerical changes but no other changes to the powers of the board of select persons except for that what i can i make a comment on that i have a question yep for oversight and appointees um subpoena authority to me it's still vague in terms of how that process happens and if there could be a line one thing I would want to see is a, a clearer path to how that would and I again I don't know if it is by charter or by who's in charge but the ability to sort of call for something and then have it be so I just would want to see more codified I don't know if I'm being clear here but one thank you you're being very very clear um in your in, in in your um observation here's one of the issues um that is problematic um we i had proposed when we were eliminating the board of select persons to shift the subpoena authority over to the rtm because um in the state of connecticut legislative bodies um local legislative bodies do not have subpoena authority the only reason you have subpoena authority in this charter is this is a special act provision. So we need to be very careful. So we didn't change this provision. This is a current provision that is here. Um, we would have been taking a shot at moving it over because it's one of the few legislative powers that you actually have. Um, this along with that $100,000 provision I just talked about are kind of quasi legislative authority. And then approval of the first select person's budget is another kind of quasi legislative function. Um, but this is the original language. Uh, I don't think we changed it. I think the note indicates it's a recodification of the current language. Uh, I would be reluctant to modify it. I don't know how often the Board of Select Persons has used their subpoena authority, whether it's ever been tested in court, but this is a remnant of your special act that goes back at least to um, 1947. So I hope that wasn't a muddled answer to your question, but uh, it's a special act authority. We did it not is. change it, et cetera. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I was just thinking about historically where it could have been used and it hasn't. And I'm trying to understand in context, like around the fill pile issue, but, and I'm thinking about future cases. So I appreciate that it's a provision that was there. I just think that if it's going to remain there, we might want to understand how it can be utilized more effectively. What's silent in that section is what the vote has to be for the use of the subpoena, for example. Um, my 
my reluctance would be to, uh, it's a power that you have. You could probably um, uh, establish a rule at the Board of Selectmen to, um, to effectuate the power. Um, the RTM could es establish a rule to effectuate the power by ordinance um, that would be consistent. Um, and um, I suppose we could establish a standard that would be a standalone sentence that would establish a standard for the adoption of a subpoena. Um, again, I don't know. We didn't do any research on it to determine um, the history and whether or not um, it's ever been used by the um, uh, board. It sounds like it should have been used, perhaps, but it was not used. But again, there's no standard, and I don't know if you have rules of the board of select persons that establish how you do certain things, but I imagine if you, in your rules, said you need a majority vote for A, B, C, and D, E could be the subpoena authority if you have rules that govern that kind of thing. Can I ask an additional question on this article, this section? Mm -hmm. Um, the mediation clause under C appointment powers, um, mediation and resolution of differences, is that an addition or is that, I was, I was, I meant to cross reference or is that a new, that's, that's new. And what is there backup? Why would, that was added? And I'd love to, which let, then leads to my next question, which would be what powers are new and duties and how did, how did the commission arrive at them? Um, but specifically, that one stood out for me. Nance, I'm, I missed that. Which one? The mediation and resolution yeah. of differences. I had, the, I had the same question. Thank you for bringing that up. I had the exact same question. And, and when would this come into play? Yeah, that's a new provision that I recommended uh, to the commission. Um, again, because there is a very... Um, a diffused executive authority, um, and that the um, you know in more in most local governments the chief executive officer, which is what the first select person is, has a lot more direct authority in terms of being able to uh, have expectations about what people will do and how they will respond. Um, this provision and there's another provision that that I've recommended to the commission that I use in a lot of our uh, a lot of my um, charters throughout the state, a cooperation clause um, that works both ways, that where uh, members of boards and commission are entitled to cooperation and members of the executive branch are entitled to cooperation, members of the RTM, Board of Finance, are all entitled to, to cooperation. The idea of this provision without giving a draconian power to the first select person was to at least have a provision in the document. Um, I don't know why it's in a different color. That That is a that should probably be fixed. Um, it gives the first select person the ability when there is a difference of opinion between boards and commissions to sit down and try to work them out. Something that he or she could probably do without this specific authority. But um, my general recommendation was that it's a lever uh, that gives, gives her the ability to um, convene the uh, disagreeing entities, if there is disagreement um, during the course of any matter that comes before uh, the government. Um, I, and again, no power that goes behind it. She cannot, um, I mean, you guys can subpoena them <laughs> by majority vote or however it is, but um, all she has is the power of moral suasion. This is yeah, can you give an example? I. Can you give an example, Steve, of when this would come into play, a concrete example? Well, this could come into play if you have a, a situation during the budget season where the, uh, let's argue that the planning commission has the ability to make determinations about what should be in the capital budget. Um, the departments uh, are conflicting with the planning uh, commission um, and the uh, first select person is trying to put together the budget that she's going to present to the board of select persons. Um, this would give her the ability to say, I need everybody to sit down in a room and let's figure out how we're going to do this. It may not be resolved. Um, and she may resolve it very simply by making her own decision and saying, I don't care what the planning commission uh, has recommended. I'm going to make this recommendation because I couldn't get the bodies uh, to agree. 
Well, that, it's the last part of what you just said that concerns me when it when it specifically comes to, let's say, I have no problem with the, the first select person um, mediating, right? Getting the parties in a room, calling for a meeting, calling for a discussion. Um, when you throw in there the word resolution, it seems to me it it takes on a whole new meeting unless now I'm not a lawyer. Um, but it seems to me if you had, let's say, the RTM and the Board of Finance arguing against each other, the first select person could come in and bigfoot the decision versus saying, let's get in a room and mediate this out. And that that's where I'm. You know, my yeah, this doesn't give her authority over the um, RTM. The RTM is the legislative body. They're going to make the decisions they make. She would try to resolve it with them. This is more within the administration uh, than uh, otherwise. So again, I my, we may have to create an exclusion provision in here. Um, she because once this doesn't cover, for example, once. We haven't gotten to the budget provision yet, but once the board of select person sends the budget over to the board of finance, yep, that becomes a political dispute. It becomes a, a political um, issue, and right? That this does not give her the ability to convene the board of finance to try to resolve it. It gives her the ability, and you, the two of you, the ability, the other two members, to per, to persuade the board of finance that your budget is meritorious. Right. Like I said, I have. Yeah, I have no problem to leave the words in mediate. I think the the concept of resolution, or as you said, a carve out for the other elected bodies, I think is the thing that makes the most sense on this. Yeah, I, and I there's no uh, magic here, so if that's the direction you want to take, I I uh, I'll take a look at it, and 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 you should uh, you should think about it, and that should be might be one of the recommendations you make to the commission. I think that's great. Magic, can I ask, does it actually, so the way it's written, I mean, it's not as if the first select person of the future um, can demand anybody to do anything. I mean, they could ask people to sit down and try to make, mediate something, but regardless of what's written in um, there, it's not as if other bodies are just going to say, oh, it's in the charter. Now we have to listen to you. <laughs> Am I missing something? No, I said right at the beginning, it's not a draconian power. It is yeah, I didn't a. I think um, so either, but. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a power of moral suasion and it's just written. I think it's something right. you already have an obligation to do as the chief right. executive. It's not a of, command of, of by other community. bodies to actually. Um, no. You know. no, but when you say resolution, it implies something more than, you know, than that. I see That's it all. That way. I see trying to make a resolution, but it also. Yeah to me lends itself as something that could be done by ordinance rather than have it at, at the charter level because to me you know you talked about the word draconian and current administration aside it's no it's you know in thinking about the future to me this that's right what it does is it's it's like sets a tone of yes nobody has to do it but if you're on the side of being asked by your first select person to be part of a mediation and then you don't it sets up a whole other dynamic that just becomes uh, problematic. Is, so I would this encourage is, this to this, become more. Uh, this is not about a mediation process. These are about it's the word like resolution, right? I think, but that's yeah, what's it, getting us twisted. Yeah, and so I mean, it's about the ability to discuss the differences. To, right. I just. Yeah. You know, I mean, putting it at the charter level I was not, just ramps I was it not up. Trying to set her up as a mediator. She's the chief executive officer. It just, and yeah. It, it to me, it just it ramps something up again. Current administration aside, we're talking about future future state. So um, you know, it's not about what Brenda does successfully or not successfully anyway. Which she is. The, the reason I recommended it very simply is that the uh, limit the you're dealing with fairly limited executive authority and very limited powers, and, uh, and this is a provision I've seen. Uh, it's a provision we're talking about statewide with Title Seven reform. Um, but I think that language revisions that the uh, select people are talking about would certainly be warranted uh, because they're, you know, I just want to make it clear that the intent was not to go um, beyond uh, just making it clear. Everybody understands that the select, the first select person has a job as chief executive officer. And That's part good. of that is to mediate differences and get people to work together. Agreed. Come up with a different word so it doesn't confuse anybody. Just a comment Thank on you. that. Though. 
if I may, you know, you're saying you had put it in there and I understand you're working closely with this group. I just, you, again, it brings- well, I, I didn't put, I recommended it. I didn't okay. put it in there. I okay, recommended it. I think, just, I think it's important. voted on it. Oh, no, no. No, 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 no. I just no. want to finish my thought because I think yeah. it's important to state for the yeah. record that, you know, when you're saying that, just please be careful with language because people who go back and listen to this, there is going to be an assumption that attorney Mednick did this and he, you know, so let's, any time we can point out when it, attorney when Mednick does not have a vote on so the commission. We need to be clear. Yeah. Attorney Mednick makes recommendations to the commission. The commission approves or disapproves. This was something I recommended, something they approved. Uh, it could be improved beyond that. And, and I think that uh, Selectman it, Flynn has some good thoughts on it. And I think it goes back to my original point, which I brought up in the beginning. Like, I think people will want to hear what was voted on specifically. And I know that's not part of it, but I think it's important to understand when something is, for instance, the size of the RTM, was that voted on versus not? And so we can understand where we stand, but just making that comment. We can move on from that. I do have more questions about this. For the, record, for the record, the commission operated by consensus for the most part. There were some issues where there were specific votes, but in the end, the whole document was voted upon by the entire commission. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Yeah. And we did not move from meeting to meeting. We did not move forward uh, without some consensus that what the language was, was language that the commission felt comfortable with. I I'll defer to the chair and the vice chair and others on that, but we never moved from a meeting uh, without um, that clarity. And my drafts after meetings were based on agreements and understandings that the commission arrived at. Uh, so I'll make it very clear. I made recommendations. I had no vote. I do have a question about another provision. On this section? Yep. Okay. The town um, administrator, should I go ahead or? Yes, go right ahead. Okay, so the town administrator, I have heard um, this administration advocate for it. I have no problem with having it in the charter, um, but there is historic, um, I don't want to overuse the word trauma, but from a time where we had cut this as a body, as an RTM. And so I have no problem now putting it in the charter. I think it's appropriate, but I don't think it goes far enough actually with the appointments and duties. Um, you know, I've heard from this current administration, the value add, and I don't doubt that. I just think that having it codified in the charter warrants it being a little more specific since historically it was the source of de great debate. So another comment perhaps for a motion at the end. What, what Nance, can you rephrase that? I didn't follow it, I'm sorry. Well, I just did the history of it, but what are you, what might your provision? The appointments and duties, I just don't, I think it's, it's, it almost sounds that it's a first, it is a first selectman appointment. So it just makes it, I would imagine it would make it less political if it's really outlined what the roles and responsibilities are so oh. that it doesn't come up for debate as to the value add of it. So you want so you want a clear definition of the roles and responsibilities of the town administrator in the charter? Yep. Okay. I think if we're going out of our way to put it there, which again, not questioning yeah. the appropriateness of it or right. You know, I think it. that the commission talked about this at great length and they were very concerned about putting a job description and in, in the charter. Um uh, Chairman Caffarelli or uh, Attorney Mednick, do you wanna talk about that? There's different models that different communities have um, um, employed and uh, background document number 10, which was provided to the commission in April when we were looking at this, laid out a number of those different models. Um, and, um, and there's different schools of thought. You can delineate uh, provisions. Uh, if you take a look at Darianne, they have, um, five or six different provisions. If you look at uh, Hartford, it's very, um, very uh, minimalist. Stanford uh, and uh, Stratford are, um, have some uh, responsive, you know, has some delineated responsibilities, uh, but I think the commission decided that this would be um, something that would be uh, subject to the um, chief executive, again, Anything that's in a charter, I want to point out for the record so everybody understands it, 
can be interpreted through ordinance. So the RTM could establish responsibilities, um, delineate responsibilities that are undelineated in the charter uh, for the um, for any position in the charter. When it comes, they can't contradict what's in the charter, but if the charter is wide open, they have the ability to make modifications in real time. And I think that's the theory behind just having the broad uh, responsibilities um, and having very clear uh, delineation of broad experience, responsibility, background, uh, and qualifications. So you can go either way. The commission decided to go with a, um, a broader definition as opposed to a, uh, a more um, robust delineation of responsibilities. And I, I would also argue the point that having this as a board of selectmen appointee rather than a first selectmen appointee also might take out some of the politics of it, which, you know, it's not necessarily a bad word. I just, um, in looking at ways in which we might approve, which would improve process. So just a thought. I have one more, uh, one more point on this item, uh, not on that specific item, but another uh, point in here. And then I have a comment. I unfortunately have a hard stop at 630 this evening. I thought two and a half hours would get us through. I'm not at all surprised we need Wednesday as well. Um, but I have a, a business obligation that I can't move. Um, the other provision in here, the $100,000 contract, uh, I don't have a problem with um, the contracts coming for review. And, and Jim and, and Steve, the two attorneys, you guys stepped me through a bunch of this, and I appreciate that as well. Um, I wanted to know, and I didn't ask this, um, where did, why is 100,000 the right number? That's, I guess, the one sticking point on this provision that I have is why isn't it 50,000? Why isn't it 25? Why, why is 100,000 the magic number? Do we know? There's no magic to the number. It's, you could make it 50, you could make it a quarter of a million. Um, we thought it was a sufficiently substantial number. I recommended it as a sufficiently substantial number. Um, where um, uh, I've used in other communities, because remember, we're talking about items that are exempted from the competitive procurement and solicitation requirements. It might mitigate that you go lower, that you don't want to have, you don't want to have, uh, you don't want to encourage non-competitive. Um, well, that's right. Um, that's right. So yeah. a lower number may not be problematic. I think the number of one hundred thousand was a number that I had recommended as being a, a, a reasonable number. Um, but um, but if you want to discourage exemptions, you can make the number a lower number. Yeah, I'm thinking that I, I would like to look into this, but I'm not sure. I'd, I'd like maybe the finance department to take a look and see of all the contracts we look at that that fall under this, what what might it be? What, what might a good number be? And I see Nancy has her hand up. Um, this is one of the things that I also thought about in connection with the Board of Education contracts. Um, does it, will it have an impact on when and how often the Board of Selectmen have to meet if it's gonna come before us? So I just think that these are things to consider. And again, would love to hear somebody weigh in from the commission or, you know. So, if, what, uh, yeah. I know that uh, Attorney Baldwin, you might wanna weigh in or uh, Attorney Mendick. I know that they kind of, um, uh, do uh, or mirrored other communities. Apparently, we did it sort of an antiquated way. Um, sure. And they were trying to do it more modernized. Uh, Attorney Baldwin, go right ahead. Yeah, I, I would just tell you that as as the one who presents uh, dozens and dozens of contracts to the Board of Selectmen uh, in the course of a year, that uh, I can't recall a time since I've been town attorney when this has a situation like this has presented itself. So it's not even a blue moon, which happens twice a year. This is just a, a very rare situation by my experience. So why do we bother putting it in the charter just as I'm asking, Jim? I don't know. Uh, I think it was Attorney Mednick's suggestion that in the event there is such a situation that arises, that it, when it does, it should uh, be brought to the attention of the Board of Select Persons. And I, I think that's appropriate. And I think the commentary about perhaps reducing that number uh, would make sense. Uh, it's, I mean, yeah. that's, been, that's not a magic number, as you said, but it's, it's to my recollection has not happened 
and, and uh, you've been on the board of select persons, uh, and I don't believe that anything's been presented to you uh, in your own memory uh, that would qualify under this section. No. Yeah, I think a low number would be the way to go on this one. I had one last uh, comment here that wasn't addressed. I don't know, Nance, if you had something, I don't want to cut you off or, or Brenda. I have lots of something, so <laughs> go ahead. Okay, uh, quickly then. Um, in this area, one of the things that we had discussed early on was kind of the, for lack of a better word, the salad of which positions get appointed by the first select person versus the board of select people. And I, I've never gotten a good explanation. I'm not saying you guys, I'm just saying in general, I've never gotten a good explanation of how we ended up with these positions get appointed by the board of selectmen. These positions get appointed by the uh, first select person. I would just like some consistency and some rationale surrounding that, that process. That's, that's, and I don't care which way it goes, you know, I, that's not, I'm just trying to figure out how did we come up with where we are and why does it make sense as to which positions are by the board and which positions are by the first select person? I can tell you that we didn't change anything except we added this new position uh, that was placed in there. But uh, I don't believe, and I'll defer again to Chairman Caffarelli or the vice chair, I don't think we changed any of the other appointment authorities. We were going to grant the first select person all of the appointment authorities of the board of select persons uh, if they were eliminated. But otherwise, I don't think we made any changes in that area at all. And I wasn't here when you when these charter provisions were adopted uh, back in the day. So I can't but, tell you how right they the way they when did. We, when we first met, right, you guys asked very succinctly, what things would you guys like addressed in the in the charter? These were one of the things that I think I said very spe specifically at that time. I think somebody else on the board might have also agreed with me on that, that they wanted it looked at. And so I was disappointed to see this part wasn't looked at. That's all I'm saying. This is, this is uh, Attorney Baldwin. I'll confirm what Attorney Mednick said, which is uh, all the appointments other than the chief of staff and the, the chief administrative officer, which are being now put into the charter, su suggested or proposed to be put in the charter, remain the same as before. So to get the, the rationale behind that, uh, I guess you'd have to do a, a deep dive in the legislative or charter history uh, of when and how that came about. Well, I guess what I, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is why don't, why don't we look to change it? Maybe we should. That's kind of my point. I would, I just jump in as, you know, haven't watched all these meetings. I mean, they were, I mean, there was so much, um, I would say, you know, uh, discussion from not only the commission, but also from the public on literally any change. So I think they probably were a little gun shy. They were like, just leave it alone. <laughs> Because yeah, every I, little change, uh, I see uh, uh, Vice Chairman Brogan, please. Yeah, I, well, I not so much gun shy, but I think we realize that each one of those persons related to a department or a board, and that would require, in fairness, digging into that department or board. And in the time period we had, we could not have done justice to that. I, that's my opinion of why we never got to it. Um, sure, it would have been easy just to go, here's a batch and put them one way or the other, but that would have repercussions and we should look at that point into the history. We should talk to the people why it's that way. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of things that aren't apparent on the surface. So, uh, at least in, for me, that's why we didn't get really that deep into that question. I think it's a fair point, but I think we just, uh, time ran out. Thank you. Can I ask a you know, I, I Tom, have, were you finished with yours? No, go right ahead. Okay. I, um, Commissioner Brogan brings up a great point, which is the time period. And one of the, my most, you know, my, one of my biggest concerns is that this time period feels somewhat arbitrary. Um, I know nine months is a very long time and, and, but 
I think the Board of Selectmen, unless I, and someone wrote a letter about this, I think, today, about voting on the time period. I think that was part of our charge. And I don't recall that we ever did. And I'm just concerned that we're trying to push something through. And I appreciate we're spending a lot of time today. But this hefty document, again, I go back to this idea that this is like a once in a decade thing. It needs to have time. And you know, when we reference that we ran out of time, that really concerns me because if nothing, we should be giving this time. And so there are ways around that. So that if we need more time, if we need more of it, you know, if if two days is not enough for the board of selectmen to go through, then so be it. Because this is literally the most important I, thing I will do in public office. Um, so, you know, I just don't want to give any of it short shrift. So if we could have resolved some things, if we had more time, I would go back and say, let let's give it that due. Just, just one observation on that uh, to pick up what First Select Woman Kupchuk said. So many topics that we picked up and touched or heard about had such, you know, political implications and people thinking this was trying to be done or that was trying to be done, which caused us to say we need to set some of these issues aside because we're not going to get to resolution, even if we had more time, because of the issues associated with changing any and everything so i think that's a fair statement um i i look at it listen nancy i think that um you know while there's not any significant uh changes to our form of there's no change to our form of government um and there's some changes there's not significant changes in the, this document I think, um, as I uh, wrote in my newsletter, I think this was a good sort of framework um, to make some modernization changes, to organize the charter in a more easy to understand way, even if you're not an attorney, um, and some minor changes that make it, uh, I think, a more um, productive and efficient uh, document. And, you know, it sets the framework for people in the future. You don't necessarily um, have to <coughs> Uh, wait 10 years. I mean, people can reopen it anytime they want. Um, changes can be made to it as you go along. Uh, I think, you know, uh, John Wynn was right. There was a lot of, you know, pushback on, on pretty much everything. Um, and I don't know that time would have changed that. I think, you know, maybe incremental change is the way our community wants to handle things um, incrementally small changes a little at a time um, because anything really discussed really brought a lot of um, you know lot of feedback that wasn't always positive so I don't think we should scrap and do nothing because our charter is very disorganized and there's some real issues it's reformatted in a much better way and there's some good changes in here that I think are, are beneficial so I wouldn't want to say you know throw the baby out with bath water just because there's not everything you want in it. I'm not suggesting baby and bath water. And, and I think pushback is actually the, the healthy part of this process. And I think the rigor and the challenges and the questions, we shouldn't be afraid of them. In fact, we need to be facing them head on. Thus my asking so many today, and I'm sure I will continue on Wednesday because, you know, we talk about modernization and I'd like to understand how this new charter that went from, I think, 50 pages to 100 is more user friendly, broadly speaking. And that goes back to the philosophical questions I asked in the beginning, because I'm not sure at this point it, it does that for me. And again, no disrespect to the work. I just think it's not there yet. And I'm, I'm saying that this is the hard work of doing that so that we do get to a document that is more modern, easier to understand. And it is going to take time and we just have to not be afraid of the pushback and the controversy. And I go back to my, the points I was making, not because it was emotional, but let's look past the emotion and see what people are really saying and asking, because I think that's where we're going to, to, to make progress. So uh, that was the point of making my earlier commentary, not because the, the comments, I didn't like them, although I don't like the vitriol. I think we need to look at what people are saying behind the language. So. That's my point, not throwing out the baby in the bathwater. Okay, um, do we wanna go, uh, Attorney Meg, do you wanna move on to the next um, 
Exemption. Happy to do so. I, I was just going to point out a couple of things for the record. That one is that there is a statutory uh, time frame um, limit of 16 months, but we are also in a period where we have constraints on time because the commission is now reported to the uh, board of select persons. Um, you don't have to resolve this by Wednesday, so you can resolve it the next week or the week after. There is more time for the board of selectmen to um, consider this, but we are kind of capped out on what the commission can do. We can only now respond to those items that are raised by the um, by by you to them. Uh, so that that needs to be understood is that we are now in a uh, a time a frame where where final decisions have to be made. And I think that the in initial intention was to have this on the ballot for November. And so the final action has to be taken uh, by mid to end of August so that the ballot questions can be submitted to the Secretary of State's office the first week in September. Ba based on, you know, again, I would just push back that I appreciate what you're saying for this process, but for something of such import, having it on the ballot for this November in some ways is arbitrary. I mean, I'm sure there are ways around this, whether it's, so I just wanna to be totally clear when we're, or maybe you could answer that. It seems to me that there could be other ways around that, that yes, given the current state and status of this commission with this document, 16 days and all of that, but there really is nothing saying that we have to have this on the ballot for this November, am I right? I'd have to see what your original resolution said. I believe that the uh, my understanding was that it was intent of the board of select persons to have this on the ballot for this November. The process was created, was started, and once you start the process, you have a calendar that clicks. Um, you can have a referendum anytime you want under law. Um, so you can finish the process and have a special referendum. The problem with special referenda is you need to have a percentage of the population that comes out to vote. So my normal recommendation is to attach um, a charter referenda to already uh, general elections. Um, so you can you can change the date of the um, of the of the referendum if that's what you choose to do. But it's not going to expand the time for consideration. You still have time as a board of select persons to look at this. Uh, over the course of the next few weeks. Um, it's just that if you're gonna get it on the ballot for November, if that was the intent of the original resolution or if that was the letter of the original resolution, um, then you're gonna have a problem if you don't get it done by the first week in, by, uh, submitted by the first week in September. That's the constraint. And the other point that I'd like to make, it's not a 10 year process. You went 16 years, whatever it was. You can do, I did charters in the late 1980s, and early 90s, in Bridgeport, John Matola, Commissioner Matola may remember this or may know this, uh, that uh, they did annual charter revisions to tackle specific provisions of the charter. There's merits and demerits to that um, because one section of the charter does impact other sections of the charter, but you can go back if you think there's a compelling issue that has been missed next year and do a, a very limited charter revision. So, Let's move to Article 5. Thank you. We haven't put Prue to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. He's... Keep going. Article 5. There we go. Uh, not much in Article 5, uh, as you see. Um, the um, town <clears throat> clerk, uh, it's basically the town clerk, uh, Justice of the Peace. Um, the Board of Finance, we didn't make any substantive changes in any of these sections, any any changes. Uh, it, there might be, I'm sorry. Sorry, with all due respect, it's, I, I'm finding it really, it's frustrating to hear nothing substantive. Like, I think we have to, we have an obligation to hear what that is because it is, if it's here, it's substantive. So I would just respectfully ask that. All right, let me just say something, read the document they say recodification, it means nothing was done. So if you take a look at section 5.1, I'll go through each one if you'd like. 5.1a, it's a recodification. 5.1b, recodification, no change. 5.1c, recodification, no change. Um, the It goes through that, there's slight modification 
in 205. Um, vacancies in the office of town clerk have a new internal reference in the document. That's the modification. If you'd like, I mean, I'll, I'll go through this in that painstaking detail. When I'm telling you there's no substantive modification, it means there's no legal change. If you want me to tell you what the internal reference changes are, I can do that. I think I'm, I was asking you respectfully just to be thoughtful in your language because I think people who are hearing this for the first time, it is significant because it's here. So it would be to me more satisfactory to say that there is no legal change. That is all. I was asking you to be mindful of language out of. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate Thank that. You. There is no legal change in the section at all. There are internal reference changes, but no legal change. Article six. What we did in article six is again, uh, there are some new provisions here. I will go through in some detail. There's um, this is a, a transition article because what it does is it brings together a number of the eligibility requirements. Uh, again, um, uh, no legally significant changes in any of these sections. Uh, when you get to 6.2, uh, there's uh, a new provision, 6.2 A and B are new provisions that um, address the issue of general requirements. Um, 6.2 A uh, establishes that uh, town officers, department heads, et cetera, um, have certain abilities to appoint, hire, discipline, remove officers, uh, assistants, and other employees of their department subject to the authority of the first select person, other supervisory provisions, um, provisions of this charter, provisions of law, provisions of collective bargaining agreements. It just generally establishes um, a provision that basically says, this is what department heads do. Um, your charter did not have such a provision in the past, this is a new provision. Uh, section 6.2. Yeah. Sorry, excuse me. The I, I don't know if you got, well, go ahead, because you're at 6.2. Go ahead. Sorry. 6.2 6 B is also new. Um, it's um, a provision that basically says qualifications for all of the appointed town officers, including department heads, and including, in addition to those that are enumerated, um, here in the charter, special acts or general statute shall be prepared by the director of human resources. The qualifications shall be prepared in accordance with nationally accepted professional standards and best practices in the applicable field and shall be reviewed and updated if necessary every four years and whenever a vacancy occurs in the position. Uh, heretofore, there was no such provision. There was no standard, uh, a best practice standard or nationally accepted professional standard uh, in the charter. So that is a new provision in the charter. Um, under section 6.4, they were simply recodifications. Uh, no, in 6.4B, um, I believe that there was a change here to um, move the ethics commission to the April 1st appointment date. Sorry, can you go back? Because I feel like you're speaking the words. I hear them. There's a, there are a lot of footnotes with section 6.1 in article 6. And can you just talk through these major, you know, it seems like with all these footnotes, I just don't understand where these came from because they this does seem significant. Or were these not, was it not, I just maybe need to hear you say it again. I just don't, I don't 6. understand. 6.1A um, was a modification. I believe that the um, town, the town um, constables, uh, let's see, I think we deleted. So oh, we made a modification. The chief of police and fire chief must be a resident of the state of Connecticut. That's new right. language. Are we um, concerned? In that I guess I'm. I have a question. And then the town attorney can be an elector. Is that a different? 
I think there's an opportunity here, you know, there's concern and this is the previous administration. So it's no, it's not a comment on current state. It's really about thinking about the future and what has been, which I'm curious about the fact that the town attorney can be an elector. Is that something we should, how did you get to that? Because I have a question. And then the chief of police being resident of the state of Connecticut is a far swath. I'm wondering how we got to that. If there's we didn't concern. change that. The, the the town attorney language is current language. Um, there was a request before the commission. I'll defer to members of the commissioner to modify the residential uh, requirements for police chief and fire chief. And the commission made uh, agreed to make that change. So I'll just jump in. I think the, the language, Nancy, says that the town attorney, it should be an elector, which means they live in town. Right, Which I believe always was, and um, as we all know, um, our last two police chiefs were forced to rent apartments in town because they weren't living. Oh, I, in town. Yeah, yeah, I don't. So we were I'm, trying to fix that um, yeah. because it seemed like an antiquated um, uh, language in the charter, and so that's why it's there. Yeah, no, I agree that that it was antiquated and, and don't disagree. I'm just wondering in terms of the, the again, the wide swath of the state of Connecticut, is was there dis discussion about? Yeah, they had a big discussion. Yeah, they had a long discussion during that meeting. I watched it. Um, yeah, they talked about a lot of stuff, 50 miles, Connecticut, right. and they so ended up with Connecticut because they felt if you're a resident of Connecticut, you're certified and all of that. And I just, it's it, it, for me, again, something is to be considered because, you know, a 50 mile swath may be appropriate. And so I'd love to know how they arrived with the state ultimately, if it was voted on and the same with the town attorney, because I think there's an opportunity there for future state to have that position be a, a non-elector um, just to take out some of the um, perceived political nature of that position someone who might be, um, and again, the not a attorney issue, state. Um, the town attorney issue did not come before the commission, but the chief did. I'll defer if the chair is still here, the vice chair on the police issue. I think the first select person actually laid it out pretty clearly. I think so too. Okay, um, something I can the raise. of 6.1 B, C and D, are just re recodifications, uh, with the exception of the uh, modification of the start date for the ethics commission. Okay, Brenda, are we going to pick this up on Wednesday? Yes, I mean, I, I I'm going to go a little longer just so we can get through some more because there's some time here. Um, so I'll say we'll stop at seven um, and then we'll pick sure. it back up on Wednesday. Um, I, I'll, I'm gonna have to figure out how we're gonna work this out. I may do the public comment first, just, or maybe after I, I gotta figure out how, what's the most efficient way to do it. Okay. Okay, I'll follow back up. I thank everybody for their time. Um, I've gone through these sections with the attorneys already, so I'll be following back up. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate you uh, putting that work in. Yep. Take care. All right. Thank you. Bye. Then, Thanks. Continuing in Article 6, if I can, 6.5, um, 6.6, 6 6.7, 6, uh, 6.7 are all simply recodifications, no changes. Um, 6.8 is a section I referred to earlier. This is kind of a um, cousin of the section on mediation and resolution. Won't use those words, but th that's what I was talking about earlier. Um, this is a language that really kind of says to people that there needs to be cooperation between um, all of the officials of the community. Uh, again, there's nothing compulsory about this. There's no compulsion to force people to cooperate, but having the constitutional language in the document, um, I believe has has uh, uh, has benefits uh, for those people that uh, 
um, can um, those person people who can um, who who work for the government. And uh, let's see one other section here. Can I ask a question while you're looking? Um, minority representation, I appreciate that it's just a recodification, but I know that in my time serving on the Board of Selectmen, that has been the subject of some question. Was there any discussion to change language to make it more clear? 6-3. No, I, I'm, I'm looking at it. Um, this issue did not come up um, during the process. Except uh, to apply it to the <laughs> the the RTM, but this sec this provision was not reviewed um, during the process. I don't think there was one public comment asking us to review the section. I'd have to look back, but uh, it was not reviewed. I think the Board of Selectmen automatically has minority representation, just based on the way our elections are. Well, these are members of appointed boards and commissions. This oh, is, uh, okay. I'm yeah. sorry. I thought it was, you were yeah. speaking to Board of Selectmen. Yeah. And you have a you have a stricter standard. The bare majority standard um, mm -hmm. is a stricter standard than the state. Um, right. uh, so, you know, if you want to make it a looser standard, you certainly can do that. You but the commission did not review that section. Is there a recommendation or something that everybody should think I, about? Or I just it's something that has come up in the past and. I was curious if there was any attention. It's been a cause of some back and forth historically, but I don't have any additional questions or recommendations at this moment. Okay. Um, article seven and eight, I'll go through. Uh, my basic position is that there were, with the exception of some changes in the qualifications, the director and departments of, um, of public works and the director and departments of parks and rec, um, as well as the names of the flood prevention, climate resilience and erosion control boards. Um, there were no, most of this was recodification. Um, and a, a lot of the re modification provisions uh, would be internal references. Um, but the major changes that were made, if there were any changes, were made with regard to, uh, as I said, the director of Parks and Rec, and the name of the prevention, the flood prevention, climate, climate resilience, and erosion control board. It is the um, chief of staff a change in the charter? The chief of staff is back in the um, executive section. Right, and then it says, as a town officer, a off officers appointed by the first select person, town administrator, and chief of staff. Yes, those are defined in a different section. Um, some have actually raised whether those should be in 7-1. Um, I made a recommendation that they, they be included so that members of the public can actually see who the first select person appoints to office. Um, but they're not treated uh, in the same way as town officers who run departments for the most part, but they were listed here for that reason, but there's no need to have them in that section. Right. I just think, again, as a lawyer, I'm sure you appreciate the importance of language, subtleties of language and nuance, and even mentioning that it's an addition is going to be important for people, for some people. So thank you. It, it doesn't need to be added. So it's up to you guys. I, I follow back up with with Selectman Lefkowitz. Nancy, you mentioned a question about 6-3 minority representation. You brought up the topic of board of selectmen, or board, board of select person. Um, I'm unclear as to what you're asking with that. Are you suggesting that the minority representation portion of the board of selectmen be eliminated, or were you making another point? I was making the point about boards and commissions more broadly. Um, the board of selectmen, I don't see as in the same light as the appointed boards and commissions. So I wasn't making a point about board of selectmen at all. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't have any further comments, any further 
changes, legally significant legal changes in the document until we get to um, section 8.15 uh, deals with the golf, the uh, ethics commission. We've created transition provision to move the ethics commission from their current uh, appointment date to a new uh, appointment date in April. Um, and that's the significant change in that section, which I referred to earlier. And I believe in is 8. Prue 15, on the right slide, um, Attorney Mednick is Prue on yeah, the no, right. Yeah, the, the, the slide, because a lot of these changes were relatively gotcha. minor uh, changes they were they were uh uh not referred to but i'll be happy to gotcha. point okay. them out um okay. the other is 8.16 the board of library trustees again there were changes that they had requested and if you take a look at 8.16a you will see the uh changes that were made in the section i have a question about if I may. Sure, go ahead. Um, conservation, I know we got some inbound um, questions or advocacy around uh, job requirements for conservation. And I just wanted to talk about how those, if anything is changed there, and if not, why not? Because I know there was uh, certainly co public comment around the Conservation Commission and its powers and roles and responsibilities. So I would love to have just a better understanding of how we arrived at this final language, just because we were asked the question and people advocated for it. So but I'd love to understand. I don't, I don't know what you were asked. I'm pretty sure it was changed. It stays exactly the same as it was. The, the commission um, is the appointing authority of the director and has to be approved by the first select person. And I, Attorney Mednick, I don't remember it, this coming up be, as even a change in, in, at all. I'm talking about the, the job title, you're right. I'm talking about the job requirement for the conservation director. It wasn't about the commission. So itself. I don't think that could be in the charter because that's an HR issue. Um, typically, um, my understanding of it is that, um, and in this case, we used a search firm with specific qualifications that we required. And they went out and, and did the interviews. It was a very exhaustive process, but the Charter, the um, Conservation Commission chairwoman, and I believe two I, of its members served on this um, subcommittee of the commission. And it was the prior chair and the current chair and one member served on the uh, search committee with the, um, search uh, firm we hired and they did all the work to find the most qualified candidate for our town, which I thought was a very good process and yielded us um, a very qualified um, conservation director. I'm mixing my metaphors. It was DPW and the licensed engineer. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so I, I think that um, there was a lot of feedback um, on this um, as in the other way. And it has been um, always been told to me that we, you know, our charter listed our director to be an engineer when we didn't even have an engineering department and no one ever took the time during prior uh, charter revisions to even look this closely at it. And there's a lot of things they didn't look at, the police chief things, all these things. And so for example, um, we didn't have an engineering department when this was put in the charter. So it made sense that you wanted your DPW director to be an engineer. We have an entire engineering department with a chief engineer who, who is in charge of that. And there's engineers in the department. What DPW really required um, is a manager, someone who can manage a very large department. DPW is a very large department and you need someone who has management skills to manage not only the engineering department, to manage the projects. They work with WPCA. They work with all the DPW supervisors. 
Um, so it just made sense. Um, and even when we were trying to hire um, for a DPW director after the prior uh, director was arrested, um, you know, the qualifications we wanted was managers. Um, and we were boxed into people with an engineering degree that didn't necessarily have management skills. So it just really, it made sense. And what was the other one, Nancy, you were asking about? No, I, the, I was talking about the in uh, the old charter DPW, that, that job requirement. That uh, was the only one? It was the licensed engineer. Yeah, I'm just trying yeah. to get uh friend if i may there was one additional point relating to that um dpw uh it's that we use outside expertise so much more significantly than we have at times in the past because the um you know engineering aspect of things and the regulatory aspect of things have gotten much more complex so we, the town seems to be moving more towards use of outside expertise to complement the on staff engineers and the management responsibilities of the dpw person Mm-hmm. Yep. Also, can I just add too that we did very specifically go back in and, and specify that the DPW director shall appoint or shall hire a town engineer. So that's codified in the charter as well. So you're not losing any of that engineering status. Thanks for the point of clarification. I think that's it for the article seven and eight. I would um, respectfully love to wait until Mr. Flynn, Selectman Flynn is here for the budget procedure and related matters. I was going to recommend the same thing. Uh, okay. Rather than start on the budget, we should probably start uh, at the next meeting on the budget. Very good. That'd be fine with me. And may I also say that it would be very helpful if any of the three of you have any questions, specific questions, um, send them over to me. I'll be happy to prepare answers for them um, for the next meeting. So if you have specific um, detailed questions about some of the changes, I respect the fact that uh, um, select person Lefkowitz is asking very, very good questions. Um, I appreciate them, but some of them do require because of the condition of the red line, uh, me to go back and look at two or three different documents. So if you have 30 pages, send them to me. I'll be happy to go through and 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 look at the questions and try to give you um, definitive answers on each of your questions. That would be that would be much that would be a lot more productive for everyone involved, obviously. Um, I know that uh, Selectman Flynn took a lot of time to sit down and go through everything with you ahead of time so he could get a better understanding of the document. So if you could send those to to Attorney Mednick, then we can have a more uh, robust discussion, more focused discussion on Wednesday. Um, and then uh, obviously I'll figure out how we're going to manage this public hearing and this, this and the uh, additional discussion. And then we'll um, move forward with the meeting uh, that we talked about on the 5th as well. Well, with all due respect, Attorney Mednick and I did speak on several occasions. And for me, I think it's important to be able to have these discussions in the light of, you know, in the light of day and publicly. Um, because I think people benefit from the questions. I would also say that, you know, there's nothing here that we haven't discussed that we can we can't pick up on Wednesday, but I will leave you with um, I know that historically you had mentioned in a previous meeting um, and also again reiterated on Wednesday or over the weekend when we talked that you have worked with communities that have added an equity clause. And I would love you to come to the table with that on Wednesday to to understand what that could look like so that I can make a, a more informed recommendation to the commission. Absolutely, and my request was not to um, try to take this into a, a back room. My request was to give me the question so in public I could answer them definitively. If, if I have a sense of the, the detailed questions that you've got, it would be much more informative to the public for me to know that so I can answer the questions um, um, in a public setting. And on, on, uh, I'll be happy to provide, I'll send it to the, um, uh, the first select person's office tomorrow, a section of a charter that we're looking at with those provisions. But let me just say something about that. Um, that kind of provision could go into a charter. It could also be adopted as an ordinance. Um, 
And so understand that the charter is not the be all and end all. And uh, there are a number of bodies that were seeking um, uh, to be in the charter. Um, and obviously the commission didn't have time to deal with all of them. But if, if the equity commission does not make it in the charter, you can always go to the RTM and try to adopt an ordinance. But I'll get those provisions to the first select person to have distributed before our meeting on Wednesday. No, I appreciate that, Attorney Mednick. And I, I just want to say for the record, um, you know, doing background homework on important issues is not necessarily trying to hide something from the public. It's just getting information so you have a better understanding. It doesn't mean you can't ask your question um, in public. Um, I'm, I'm considering, based on the fact that we set the uh, public hearing for Wednesday at 530, you know, to try to give people the opportunity um, when they get out of work. I would like to start the meeting earlier um, on uh, the 29th for us um, to be able to talk and ask all these questions and have them answered. Would you be available at four o'clock for that meeting, Nancy? Yep, I okay. have the day. So if it even has to be earlier, I'm happy to do it. I appreciate all the questions being asked. And I assure you, I represent a constituency of people who have the same ones. So anything to do to help, you know, get those questions answered. Sure, if you could, yeah, if you could just send those over to Attorney Mednick, um, that would be really helpful. And then obviously, I mean, as far as any equity issues, if you have something that you could share with him that you think would be helpful to be included, it would, you know, is obviously um, something that may help him to understand exactly where um, you think that would fit in, um, yeah. how it would work. Uh, since you've opened that doorway, I had when I initially presented to the body, to the commission in back in October, I had talked about the inclusion of uh, a staff person of a commission, but also the reason it was brought up. Um, certainly, I'm I'm happy to share the racial equity and justice task force blueprint where they talk about ways in which you can be inclusive in a charter. But Attorney Mednick had shared that he had drafted some language, okay. uh, equity language. So I look forward to to receive hearing that or talking about that publicly on Wednesday. Awesome, and I'm gonna just check with Selectman Flynn to see if he is available. I hope he is. Um, uh, but uh, hopefully we could do that earlier and then allow the public to come in at 530. Uh, maybe we could even take a 10 minute break to eat a, a, a granola bar or something. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, thank you very much uh, for, for making yourself available. And um, I see it. I don't know. Attorney Baldwin, I see your hand up. Was that from a long time ago? Because now that the screen thing is gone, I can see you. Did you have something you want to say? Or was that uh, from no, earlier? No, I'm sorry. I apologize. That That's a, a holdover from before. Okay. All right. All right. Um, all right. So um, we will uh, set the notice up if it's, you know, if we can do this earlier. Um, and um, I'm going to ask for a motion to adjourn the meeting. Uh, so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you so much. All right. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye. Take care. Thank you.